You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. While I was in Cyprus, a lot of people I knew were experimenting with, with the smoking pot and they were starting to crack taking a bit of amphetamine. I tried a bit when I was on leave on, on that particular leave where I met this girl and I didn't know what was going on. It was like, wow, this is amazing. You know, so I was starting to experiment with drugs as well and I thought I can't do the both. I can't serve in the forces and have this lifestyle because if I get caught, kicked out, I lose everything. And then I got to this club and um, it's, we used to go there all the time and one of the lads said, oh, have you finished your, your, your shift? I said, yeah, I'm done now, mate. So, and he looked hammered. I said, what are you fucking on, mate? He said, oh, we've had a pill. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. I said, you want one? I went, I don't know. I said, yeah, why not? Fuck it. First time I've ever seen proper coke was when this guy dropped the keel around and sat on that and we opened it, took the rubber jackets off of it and all the fucking tape and all the the, the plastic which had pressed onto it and peeled it away and it's just like, like a grainy look on there. So I thought, fucking hell, look at that. You could take on two kilos, costing you a hundred grand, say for argument's sake. You could make 30, 40 grand on that. You could make more. I really liked the idea of a challenge. And I know it's my life I'm playing with, but I love the idea of thinking, can I fucking wing this? Because I knew that I was risking your life? Yeah, I, f I felt it was all right. I thought, yeah, I know I'm going to be, I'm, I know I'm in trouble, but I like teetering on the edge of that fucking knife edge. I know that this is where, that's where I like to be. I like to be in that little zone where if you go that way, you're right. If you go that way, you're fucked. Did you know what you were doing was wrong then, but you still wanted to be part of something? Yeah, the sort of right, wrong didn't really come into it. I, I knew that it was wrong because, because I knew, but it didn't feel wrong. Every single fucking day, I was worried that if he finds out what I've turned into, he's never going to forgive me. Ben Moran, today's guest, we've got Rich Jones. How are you, Rich? How are we doing, mate? You okay? Good, thanks. How's okay. life? It's all right, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Slow and steady. So, The Lost Soldier. Yeah. Done nearly 10 years in the army. Nearly 15 years in prison for a conspiracy to sell drugs. Yep. I think you've done a bit of um, close protection stuff as well, bodyguard. Yeah, yeah. When I came out of the forces, it was like the the natural thing to do. It, it felt right. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to go into any sort of manual trade. I thought, well, let's have a look at that. And it was daft because um, at the time it was 94 and uh, there's a film out of Whitney Houston and Kevin Costner, The Bodyguard. Yeah, classic. Sort of like, it stuck in me head of, oh, that looks like a really good life. And you get given a budget from the forces. When you leave, they say, look, you know, you can um, look for this big manual and decide what you can do. Mm -hmm. So we had a look and the budget was, I think about two and a half grand, give or take. And it, it was affordable to do this course with the ex-SBS down in a hotel in Maidstone. And we jumped on it, me and another, another lad. And it was all right. So a bit of a mad journey. You, mate, you don't seem the kind of guy. You're very well-spoken, very articulate. Yeah. To then being army man, to then being in prison, conspiracy charges, conspiracy is yeah. a bastard. That's the worst one. It's horrible, mate. Yeah. So I always go back to the start for my guest though, brother. Yes, where you mate. grew up and how it all began. Yes, mate. Right, yeah. So, I mean, I, I grew up in Bristol, as you can tell. Um and it was a normal childhood. It, it was There wasn't anything wild about it. I mean, my dad had a good job. He was in the police force. Dark copper as well. Yeah, which is the irony of that. Um, so we had a good background. You know, the, it, was, it was all going well. It was in the 70s and the 80s. And uh, it was going well until my mum and dad split when I was 14. It was on the cards, you know, because life back is, is a copper back in those. That was a fucking tough life to have. You know, it was hands-on policing. It wasn't like, you know, pepper sprays and tasers. It was like truncheons and fists. Mm -hmm. So we had a hard life and he used to he used to drink a lot, but it doesn't mean that he was a drunk, but the 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 lifestyle then was, was you know, finish the shift, go get drunk or go play rugby. So marriage is on the, marriage in, in any police force, military, the, 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 the stats are low to, to get through it. So yeah, when I was 14, mum and dad split. My mum left. My dad had custody of me and my brother. And um, we kind of like, being the kids of someone in the police, 
you learn to be evasive from a very young age because if you fuck up, there's a good chance you're going to get found out. So we learned to be evasive and a little bit sneaky. So when my mum and dad split, I kind of um, started to go off the rails a little bit. What were you? Started bunking off school, which is which wasn't the intention. I kind of like, my dad had rang the school up and said, look, he spoke to my tutor, he said that Richard would go through a divorce. Can you keep an arm, Rich? He might be a bit upset at times. I was quite devastated by the whole thing. I'm not blaming that for how things turn out, but that's just the way it goes. Um, so the teachers kind of give me a little bit of slack. And I think there was one occasion, and I'm just, I'm not guessing, but I'm trying to cast my mind back a long time. I was late for, for a tutor, for, for, for register. And he said, when I got in, he said, he said, don't worry, it's okay. We know what you're going through. I thought, all right, okay. I wonder how far I can push this. And then a couple of guys I knew were bunking off at the time. And I said, look, do you want to bunk off for the morning? I thought, well, let's give it a go. So I did, and we never got found out. So I was doing it more often. And this is right at the crucial stage of my education. It was right in, you know, I was 14, leading to 15. We're looking at mock exams, looking at back then it was, it was CSEs and O-levels, I think, back in the, back then in the 80s. So really I completely ballsed up my whole education by really sort of not paying attention. And I had no interest in, in the kind of jobs that were being offered to guys and girls of that era were very generic. You know, it's like a, if you're a guy, you're going to be a brickie or a plasterer. You're going to be some kind of like tradesman. I thought, well, I'm not really interested in that. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me at all. So really, I was just drifting in and out of, of, of different things. So I, I knacked up my education. I didn't know what to do for a job. And at the same time, my dad had met someone else when I was about 16, 17. And, uh, Did that affect you? It did. Well, the funny thing is, the first person that he met was good as gold. She was brilliant, you know, I really got on with her. She was a lovely woman. She got me a job working in Bristol Airport, funny enough, as a, as a kitchen porter. It was my first job at 16. She was amazing. And, and she was really good for my dad. And then that broke when my dad met. My dad was on a, a course in London, so when he met someone else, she was from Sweden. I thought, well, that sounds all right. And he, he ended up getting with this Swedish woman. And the problem we found was that she was a lot younger than my dad. Not a problem if you're my dad, that's great. But for me as a 17 year old, and she was, I think, 26, she was nearer my age than my dad's. And there was a conflict. I wasn't easy anyway at 17. I, I wasn't saying I was a horrible kid, just being a teenager. And she didn't know how to cope with me. And it's not her fault. And I look back now, I think, fuck, that must have been really hard work to deal with me. So we weren't getting on. So my dad was having to sort of make decisions about who does he decide to, who is he going to side with? Who is he going to work with? You know, it, does he believe his son? Does he believe his wife? So I had this thing where I was hating my jobs that much. The the first job I had, I was welding on an apprenticeship for 25 quid a week. And it's fucking awful. It just wasn't enjoyable. And so I started bunking off from that. And I got caught by my dad. And he gave me a proper bollocking. I thought, fair enough, I won't do that again. Three months later on, I got another job. Start bunking off from that as well. I just didn't want to settle. So my stepmom said, look, you've, you've been found out again. We know you're not going to work. He said, why don't you join the army? And I thought, that's not a bad idea. I'll get away from you for stars and I'll maybe just not quite get through the whole process. My aim wasn't to actually join the army. It's to get me down off my back. So maybe sort of go through the motions, you know, go to the, the, the careers office, have a chat, see what's going on. And then next thing you know, I passed all of the, the, the tests and they weren't hard. The up to chest, that, that wasn't that wasn't hard. And then I'm off at Sutton Colford for eight for I think thirty six hours to do like a one and a half days worth of fitness and assessments. And that wasn't overly difficult. My fitness wasn't on peak, but it was enough to get me through the door. And what I found was I was getting ready for close for a base to, to go for basic training in nineteen eighty eight. And um someone said to me in one of the one of the clubs, I was out clubbing with my friends, and they said, um I said, Rich, you'll never get through it. You, you won't do it. You, I don't think you've got it in you. And that just turned me. I thought, fuck you, I will do this. So I got the basic and I just kind of like, I didn't sail it. It was really hard. It was in the 80s when, you know, when, the, when the NCOs were allowed to punch you if you got it wrong. They could, you know, literally could stand there and whack you in the guts, chin you if you got something wrong. So it wasn't easy, but it was doable. It was doable. So I got through basic and that, that was, that was life changing for me. And I think the bit that got me the most, I think the first time was we passed out. It was 
July the 3rd, 88. And all through, around about, you know, not far off now, actually, um, all through the whole of the, the training, it was beautiful sunshine, really hot. And we got to the pass out parade. And it was on a Friday, and it was pissing down with rain, absolutely hammering it down with rain. So hard, it was raining up on the square, like this sort of mist on the deck. And um, we were marching around doing the pass out parade. And my, my dad was there with my stepmom, and my nan, and my brother, and a few other family members. And we do the bit where we we do the we go past. It's called the carry shed. We do what's known as an eyes right, and it's where you salute your your superior officer and you and you kind of show respect to the people that are there. And they said prior to the parade, they said whatever you do, don't look at your family because you will get emotional. You, there's a good chance you're gonna you know, you're gonna lose it on parade. So we're marching along, and they said eyes oh, right. Looked across, caught my dad straight in the eye, and I could see he was welling up. I thought, wow, he's really proud. And the first time ever, I saw my dad being proud of me. And I thought, I think I've made the right choice here. Going into the army, I've made the right choice. Might have been the wrong reason to go in, but I think I've made the right choice. Is your dad strict on you? No, not really. He was really good. He wasn't strict. There was never any kind of, no, there was never any beatings. My dad's never hit me, never laid a hand on me. You know, it wasn't necessary because I've, I've always had a massive respect for my dad. But... I just kind of wanted, I guess I just always wanted to impress him. And bouncing between jobs when I was a kid, it just wasn't doing the job. I, I, I realised then that I wasn't wired up for doing that kind of work. Was there much love, attention, or was there a lot of abandonment from there was mom a, or dad? There was plenty of love. There was no shortage of a loving background. Um, my mum moved away, but we did see her occasionally, which, again, me and my mum get on really well. There's no, no problems there. I think the problem we had is when... My dad took custody of my brother and uh, and myself. He was working full time hours, so we had a lot of family looking after us. Because he, although he was there, he was also away a lot. So it kind of like became slightly detached from the whole family thing. So my my sort of vision of what a family unit was no longer existed. It's a mum, a dad, me and my brother. That was my family. And when, once that was ripped apart, and I say ripped because that's how it felt at the time my idea of a family just kind of got a little bit fractured and a little bit confused. So I didn't, and I'm still the same now, I'm quite a, a bit of a nomad, although, although I've got my kids and my ex-wife and we're all very, very close, I don't I don't really engage well with family occasions because I just don't feel that family, I'm beginning to feel it more now, but I didn't feel it then. So do you see a lot of yourself and your dad? Yeah, too much, too much. The broken I, relationships, kind of ex-wives, mm, girlfriends. Yeah, the way that we are as well with our perception in life, how, how we approach things. And my dad's had a, you know, he's had a major stroke now a while ago. You know, he's, he's paralysed, but he still communicates. He's still my dad. And I still see me in him and he still, he sees, he sees him in me, if you like. We're very alike, although I'm slightly wired up wrong compared to, my dad's a really, really good person. Very good person. And, and I believe I am as well. But we've got this little element in us, which kind of like, strays off piece slightly every now and again and I, I just couldn't yeah. control that How what regiment did you serve in? so I joined the NATO the 3rd Royal Tank Regiment and what's that? so basically we were based over in Germany and we were working on Challenger tanks so I, w I went in as a tank gunner so when you when you finish basic training you get to go trade training which means you, if, if you go in as an infantry soldier you do your basic training although it's quite extensive um, as a, a tanky we go in as a, a gunner or a driver so I was a gunner and it's a great job and it's amazing working inside the turret of a tank. It's something else. You, know, you get in there, you've got all the, all the kit, all the machinery, all the different sites and it's a good place. To, well, it's not a good place to get hit, but it's a great place if you just want to experience something different. You know, so yeah, as a, as a tank soldier, we were based in Germany during the Cold War. And a lot of people probably won't even remember what that is. You know, we were in something called BAOR, which is British Army on the Rhine. Is that early 90s? When is that? Yeah, that was in late 80s, 88. Uh, I left in 90, uh, 95. So yeah, all through until until about 92, when, say, the Berlin Wall came down in 89. That's when it changed significantly. There, there were like, at the time over in Germany, about 50, 55,000 strong British soldiers in Germany alone heading up the sort of front against the, what used to be the Warsaw Pact, Russia and the communist state. So a lot of us over there, you know, so that really went on. And once, once that kind of war came down in 89, a lot of things started changing. The, the, the military started to pull out. 
reduce the size of the forces which they've been building up over years. Well, we, we don't need this anymore. There's no threat. Why spend money on, on an army we don't need? So that created its own sort of set of problems. A lot of conflict. Yeah, lots of different conflicts in town, especially with lots of board squaddies, usually with the jocks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've done I've done some social media with with <laughs> it. Um, RHF Black Watch, mate. These guys are just unreal. You know, Glasgow based as well. You know, and we were told um, when you get based in Germany, I was in Hamer, which was near near Dortmund, is the biggest place I can think of near it. We're told whatever you do, when you when you get posted or you go anywhere, just don't go anywhere where the Black Watch are. Even worse still, don't go near the the Royal Highland Fusiliers because they are a fucking nightmare. Yeah, yeah. a lot of the SCS are a lot of Scottish boys, isn't it? Yeah, they are tough bastards, man. Yeah. Everybody in the army are tough bastards. That like, see, Hardy. when you go to the army, you've got to kind of be psychotic. You've kind of got to have wires of mist, yeah, like, to go to it's, war zones and and yeah. thrive on that. It ain't normal behaviour. No. Somebody has to do it. Yeah. Like, but. Everybody I've had on who's served in the military, mm. listen, they're sound. Yeah. Nicest guys you can meet, but you can tell that yeah. they're something red, loose. They're, yeah, there's something <laughs> kind of fucked up. Like, I tried to join yeah. the Marines actually when Did I was you really? 17 or 18, but I went I went to the test fucking yeah. steaming, I think I was 18. Yeah. And um, I was just fucking around, but yeah. I was just wanting to get away yeah. and just kind of do something with my life. But no, it fell through, thank God. Uh, yeah, it's weird because... Yeah, a lot of the, the guys I've served with all over the country, a lot of guys from Scotland in my regiment because that's sometimes how it falls. I mean, generally speaking, from the catchment area when you join up, depending on where you are geographically would depend on what regiment you, you would go in. It's not so much now because it's kind of all lots of really big battalions and different regiments. But at the time, 4RTR was the Scottish regiment. That was what it was. If you if you were going to go into four, or you you were from Scotland, and that's how it was. And if you weren't from Scotland, you're going for it, or you're fucked because you're not a jock, you know. And that's how it goes. But yeah, some of the guys I served with from Scotland are unreal. My my one of my tank commanders, fun enough, we called him Jock. Can't think why. Um, <laughs> he was uh, an ex para, and he was in the Falklands. Paras are tough bastards. Yeah, eh? mate. Yeah, this guy was something else, mate. You know, I've, why do the paras always fighting? It's what they do, isn't it? Why is that? Every part I have now, man, they're always scrapping. Even th- inside, even while they're on camp or whatever they're doing. Yeah. Even when they come back, yeah, they're constantly fighting. Do you know what the rule of thumb is with, with, with squaddies is, with the infantry especially, and more so the paras, is if you're out on the piss and you're in a, par- in a bar or a club, the infantry will fight the tankies or the engineers or the artillery. If none of those are there, they'll, they'll fight someone else, another infantry unit. If there's no more infantry, they'll fight another company in their own unit. If there's no other company, they'll fight someone in their own platoon. If there's no, they'll fight each other. They just love fighting, yeah, and they just they just find someone to scrap with. And I, I've been in the bars in, in Germany, yeah. and it's just waiting to go off. You just know someone's going to light that tinder, and it's going to go off any second. And you just stand there. And it's like being in the Wild West saloon. You're thinking any minute, you could sense it. You walk into the bar, you think. Fuck it, infantry there, tankies there, engineers there. Oh, it's going to be fucking chaos tonight. So what happens if the own troops are fighting with each other? Does does that get reported or do you no, get slapped the rest? It just, that's just the way it goes, you know. Just accepted? Up on, yeah, turn up on parade with bruises, cuts, fucking teeth missing, busted noses. As long as you're, you're clean shaven and your kit's pressed, they don't care what you look like. That's you bad, know. isn't it? Yeah. How long did you serve? Seven and a half years? Seven and a half years. In the Why area. did you leave? Tough one. Well, not tough one. There were a number of different reasons. The the first one was, as I said, with these defence cuts, with the Berlin Wall coming down, um, the army had changed quite significantly from the, the army I joined in the 80s to the army that it was now. It was changing in a sense of different characters, different people. They did a lot of phased out run- redundancies during the early 90s. And a lot of people that left took redundancy were like senior ranks, say sergeants, corporal staff sergeants. Now, these are the guys that held that regiment together with their experience. So what you ended up with, a lot of people which were fairly junior in their position and they were very career-minded, which is fair enough, but they took away all the dead wood. Well, that's what they refer to. We're going to weed out the dead wood. But this dead wood were the characters. They're the people that made it fun. They're the people that would, would turn a blind eye if you fucked up. So what you had is career-minded people in there. And so if you fucked up, they would give you a bollocking they charge you 
because they wanted to be seen to be doing their job properly. So that was one sort of fundamental change in the forces, which I just didn't like. And it wasn't me. It was a lot of other people at the same time thought, no, this is shit. It's not what it was. I mean, it never will be. And then we did six months in Cyprus in uh, with the UN in 1993. And that was amazing. It was six months on the piss in the sun. It wasn't a toy. We got a medal, but it's not really a medal. It's like just a, a token gesture to say, yeah, thanks for coming over and getting <laughs> drunk for six months, you know? Yeah. And that, for me, I became unhinged on that. That I got in a lot of trouble in Cyprus. Why? I, I enjoyed Iron Appa a lot. Now, we had, the army made this, and it's not a stupid mistake, but it, they, they had this notion that they'll have something called troop flats. So because we're always going to be over there in some capacity, your regiment would then rent out a block of holiday apartments, if you like, in Limassol and Iron Appa, two of the biggest resorts in Cyprus and um, we'd have every sort of like our rota was we'd do three days patrol three days on the gate which is doing your sentry duty on the on the gates of the camp three days off so every six days you're off on the piss down to and Limassol initially because we got there in I think it's the back end of November uh, 1993 so down to Limassol and I used to have loads of lovely dark hair back in the day and I was growing it long <laughs> You know, it, I was growing it longer because I wasn't under the British Army, I was under the UN. I said, put on me berry and hide it. So when I took me bear off, I didn't look like a squad. I had loads of dark hair. And this sort of thing I did, we used to go to Limassol and there was a bar in there called Piccadilly's on the main on the main drag. And um, we were really good at bullshitting as squatters. And it's something we do. We'll lie, we'll lie to, to get free stuff. We'll lie to get ourselves out of jail. We'll lie to, you know, to impress a bird if we need to. Now, that's just squatty behaviour. And... Um, I came out of this absolute fucking whopper. I was down there on, on a very, I was on a six day leave and I was getting on really well with the locals down there. And the reason I was getting on well is because I told them I was half Cypriot and I came out of this dirty, red, big fat lie. And I basically said to the staff in there, there was a girl called Susan, she was Scotland actually, I'm working beyond the bar. She said, oh, so what's your story then? And, and I said, oh, it's, it's, it's a long one. So I'll give you the brief version. I said, well, basically, my dad was over here in the forces back in the late 60s, early 70s. He said, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, basically, he met a local woman in Farm Augusta. Um, and they, you know, I was a result of that encounter. I said, but the problem we had was when the Turks invaded in, I think, the mid-70s, 75, I think, is when when the, they came over the Kyrenian Mountains and, and invaded Cyprus. Um, my dad was given the option, the best thing you could do is to, to pull out of Cyprus, take your son with you because we've been invaded. I said, I never saw my mum again. So I kind of told him this really bad little white lie because I just wanted to get free drinks. But they bought it really well. So, and I feel bad now. So much so that when I wasn't staying in the troop flats, they said, well, come and stay in our house with my family. So I was actually staying in, there's a chap, he was called Paris, really nice guy. She come stay with my family. So we we were so sorry for what happened to your mum. We've, I said, well, I don't even know if she's around anymore. I think, how do I get out of this one? So I staying at his house, and the only way I could kind of make up for it was um, because I was with the UN. They knew I was with the UN. I said, where did you come from in Cyprus? So we they said we used to live in the north. So I can you get me the address? So we can give you a map and show you where the village was. We can we can draw where the the house was. I said, well, I'm next on patrol. I'll go over there. I'll find your house for you. Because the northern half of Cyprus at, back then was more or less like a big military camp. There was not a lot going on. So I was in, in command of this patrol at the Mitsubishi Pajero, roof down, really nice day. I said to the guy that's with me, look, mate, we're, we're going to do something different today. So I like, we're going into the north. We're going to find us. It's only like five or six k's beyond the, the border of the, we call it the buffer zone. So we're going to fuck off over there. We're going to find these addresses. We're going to take some photographs. So, oh, yeah, no worries, mate. So we did that one. It's a bit of a jolly into the northern half of um, Cyprus. We found this village. So we had, to, we had a, a map which was in English on the Cypriot half. Got onto the Turkish. I went to buy another map with the Turkish right because all the signs were in Turkish. So I had to buy another map again and compare the two. We found this village and it was run down. Basically, it, wasn't, it, it was lived in, but it wasn't, it's like, you know, like something out of a video game. It had been run down. There's overgrown bushes everywhere, trees in the middle of the road. You know, so we drove through this. We looked at the map they'd drawn. We found what we thought was their house. Took some photographs of it on the old 35 mil. 
photograph of the of the town hall, the local school. None of it. It wasn't all derelict, but it just wasn't being used. You know, put it in the camera, and and that was it. Went back in six days later, and I went back down to um down to Limassol, saw mate Paris. So there's there's gave him the film. So there's the film, mate. I said, I hope I find it for you. Carried on my weekend and went back six days later. And I went back down again, and I saw me. He said, "You found it. You found our house." And that's the first time I've seen it in, that was in 1993. It's the first time, what, 20, 22 years they've seen ours. They literally fled it with a bag. That's when they last saw it. So then their mate, another girl from another boy, said, oh, can you go over and find <laughs> find my house? So I felt this kind of obligation then to go and start tracking down their old houses and photographs. And I did a, I did a couple more of those. Try to do your good deeds back. I kind of did, yeah. Karma, mm. isn't it? Mm. You know, so that was my, tra- and so I was kind of off the rails in Cyprus. I really... I was just wasn't. I was doing my job, but when I was when I wasn't working, I was just. You know, I was got caught sleeping on the gate on duty and stuff like that because I was too drunk. I drove back from Limassol, absolutely asshole. So I was just trying to get you know trying to get me end away with someone. And I, you know it, the night was getting. I was, I was due on on guard at like half seven. I left there at like five, still plastered, and I was on on the gate at half seven, drunk. So I was just doing stupid things, making bad decisions. So that. When I land back in Germany after having six months of you know, sun and partying, it was raining. I thought, oh, this is fucking awful. But all right, so we're going on leave now. So we had like three weeks sort of disembarkation leave where we're just, you know, we, we had, we'd had our operational tour. We're now going to go on block leave for three weeks. Went on leave, met a girl. And I, that's not a rare occasion, but I tried on a number of occasions to have a long term, a long distance relationship. And this is before mobile phones. It was all like queuing up on the phones in the camp. You know, so you, you put your five Deutschmarks in there at last 10 minutes, you, you have a chat, yeah, I love you, all that sort of thing. That's your relationship. It just doesn't work. So I met this girl and I thought, oh, this is the one for me. So I sort of fell head over heels in love, or thought I did. Back to Germany, and I was just like, a, you know, I sat a smack ass, I thought, I just don't want to do this anymore. Yeah, And at the time, I was starting to dabble with drugs. You know, my mates, while I was in Cyprus, a lot of people I knew were experimenting with, with the smoking pot and they were starting to crack, taking a bit of amphetamine. I tried a bit when I was on leave, on, on that particular leave where I met this girl, and I didn't know what was going on. It was like, wow, this is amazing. You know, so I started to experiment with drugs as well, and I thought, I can't do the both. I can't serve in the forces and have this lifestyle, because if I get caught, kicked out, I'll lose everything. So all these different things added together, I thought, I have to get out. I've got no choice with meeting this girl, Hating Germany, loving Cyprus, messing with drugs, the lack of promotion because of these defence cuts. I thought it's too much, and I can't see me moving, progressing any further in the army, promotion-wise for at least four or five years. I was due my second stripe, it wasn't going to happen. I thought, fuck it, I'll just get out, make a break for it now. So I did. I left in '95. Could you leave or okay, Did you have to go evil? Well? No, fine. Just gave me notice in '94. I went in, got back from leave, literally that day. I got back in, down in the camp, and I said to me, troop sergeant, I'm getting out. I've had enough. He said, right, go get yourself to RHQ. You go into RHQ, which is where all the, the admin staff are, and uh, just walk in and say, I want to get out, I want to sign off. So you've got to give a year's notice, and you got to work a year then. You can't just sort of like say, I'm going, fuck that, I'm off. You, you, could, you, you, could, you could go AWOL, but you're not getting out the right way. So I signed off for a year. That's when you start your, your resettlement, but it's not really a settlement. Like I said, they give you this folder full of what you can do for a course. And that's it. That was the resettlement. Seven and a half years. See you later. Fuck off. Yeah. See you later, mate. <laughs> yeah, that was it. And what on. happens then? What was your life like then? If you're just starting to get a taste of the party and then leave, oh, did you leave because of the bud? Yeah. But that, that she was, she was the kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. So we got together. It didn't work out. It never does. You know, so that lasted about another year because my life was going south quickly it was really going it was how can I put it when I because I left I left early on my my first tank commander was at the time of me leaving was the, was the regimental sergeant major he's the boss you got the commanding officer who's in charge of the regiment but the RSM he's the one that really is in charge of the troops so he's the one that you you, you fear but he was my tank commander and I went and saw him. I'd recently lost my uncle. My mum's brother had died, so I'd lost my uncle. I'd been home on a compassionate leave. And I'd had, my leaving date was the beginning of August with four weeks termination leave. 
And then I sort of added a couple more weeks into that because I was due some leave over the year. They calculated what was left. Well, you, you can leave mid-July. I thought, all right, fair enough. So I went and saw him. I said, look, boss, can I just fuck off? He said, our regiment are in Canada doing providing enemy for other units. It's like a sort of thing, like an exercise. We're back in the regiment. It's done a skeleton crew, like a rear party. There's only a few of us there, like maybe 100 guys man in the, man in the regiment. There's no one there I know. And he said, he said, have you got anything you need to do? I, I said, I've done everything I can. I just, there's nothing I can do. I said, I want to get back. You know, I've got things to do. I said, my mum's in bits because of my uncle and everything else. He said, pack your bags and you can get on your way next week or like the next couple of days. And literally within a week, I was I was gone. So I ended up leaving about June, what's about June the 15th. So I had then June the 15th, July, August, September, about three and a half months paid by the army still, on the payroll until the end of September. I was doing door work, getting paid cash. Uh, I was doing, starting to do some surveillance work and I was starting to branch into doing some CP work as well. So money was coming from every angle. So I was focusing on work at the time and my new relationship. But my mates were going out and that's when I discovered ecstasy. Not immediately, I was doing the door work and I was taking a bit of amphetamine when I was on the door, which was really bad for paranoia but great for like that sense of well-being initially. And then I got to this club and um, was, we used to go there all the time. And one of the lads said, oh, have you finished your, your, your shift? I said, yeah, I'm done now, mate. He said, oh. And he looked hammered. I said, what are you fucking on, mate? He said, oh, we've had a pill. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. He said, you want one? I went, I don't know. I said, yeah, why not? Fuck it. So he, he disappeared for, as, as he do, vanished for a little while. He came back and he yelled his hand out. He said, here you go, mate chucked him a fucking tenner or whatever it was I said what are these other dirty dollars I said what does that mean he said just eat it <laughs> so, I, so I necked it and there's just this sort of sense of trepidation isn't it you're waiting you're thinking what's it going to be like I'd never I'd heard so much about these things you know I just didn't know what I was going to expect and um, I remember I stood upstairs and the DJ was downstairs and I, I'll never forget it I also I could hear the conversations on the other side of the the club why the fuck can I hear them I couldn't but I could hear everything everything was amplified in my head I thought I could hear everyone's voices and then the DJ's voice and he spoke and it was I've never heard anything so loud and booming it was like it was just flying I thought what the fuck is going on and then everything started to go nuts I thought is this what it's all about and then that's I, was, I said oh, I've got to go dance and he said well I come down here so we went down and went downstairs to the dance floor and there's two lads stood on the podium, big geezers, bald heads, shirts off as standard practice. And I thought, fucking hell, these guys are, look at it, they're, they're flying. He said, that's the guys you got your pill from. And they were in the middle of this, this whole like gathering of people. And they were like the focal point. And then my mate went over and saw me, he introduced me, that's my mate Richie, just got out of the army, big hugs all round. And I thought, I really like what they're doing now. I, I don't necessarily want to be centre of attention, but I'm, I'm really enjoying what these guys have got going on here because when I'm on when I when I come on leave and I'm with my mates I'm not although I'm, I'm welcomed and I'm part of that group of people you're not part of that group of people because you're not you're you're like this little satellite on the outside that kind of like is trying to catch up with everyone's current affairs who's going out of who who's working you don't know anyone they're, they're your friends but you don't really know them because their lives have been moving on and on a different path. Whereas my life's in the forces, it is what it is, it's different. You know, so I don't really know them anymore. So you don't feel like you're part of this gathering. And then what happened when I sort of took this pill, all of a sudden I'm the same as everyone else. I'm, I'm part of this gathering. I'm part of this collective. And we're all dancing and we're all having a good time. And I think, wow, this is, and it made me feel part of something again, which I started to miss. I didn't know I was missing it, but I, I must have been subconsciously. Only. Yeah, a little bit. I, th I think it was a case of figuring out where am I supposed to fit in? You know, what what do I do? Because the army does a really good job of making you think you're really good and better than everyone else. But we're not. We're just, we're just people, but we're just prepared to go a little bit further to do what needs to be done. So you're kind of good or bad. You, the army puts you on a pedestal and you've got this ridiculous notion that, you, that, you, that you're better. So I'm not saying that you look down on people, but what you're saying is like, I'm not like these people. It was the classic case. Oh, you you weren't there, man. How do you, you don't know what I've seen. You don't know what I've done. You you don't understand the, the things I've seen and experienced in my time. 
not to mention what happens in the Nafi bar. You don't know what I've been through. So you kind of, you can isolate yourself without knowing it. That difficult to try and get back into a normal society to then being alone, not having your comrades around you. Still can't. Still can't do it now. You know, I'm, I'm not a part of, although I've got friends, family, and I engage and I get on and we laugh and we joke. If there's a group of people there, you know, and there's like seven or eight guys. I mean, I'll take work, for example. We've we've got a crew of lads, good as gold. They'll all stand around chatting and gassing. And I don't feel like I'm part of that group because I purposely will move myself away from it. And I don't know why I do it. I sometimes realise, why am I standing there? Why am I doing something different? Why am I still working when these guys are resting? And it's not because they're lazy or I don't want to be a part of it. I just subconsciously sort of separate myself from other people, groups of people, because I don't know how or where I should fit in. I don't know how I should be a part of that group because I don't know where... It's not a hierarchy and it's certainly not the alpha male, beta male, omega. It's none of that. It's just, I don't know where I fit in with these guys. But um, that's okay not to fit in. It's okay to yeah. feel different. It's okay to feel alone. It's okay mm. not to feel appreciated. It is okay as long as you're confident within yourself which is difficult because we want to fit in because we feel as if peer pressure mm, you're yeah. taking an ecstasy to fit in with yeah. other people but yeah. you'll tend to see those people you were taking ecstasy with what are they doing for their life now well this is it you know some of them are still probably still doing it you know yeah. and and it's but it, it was weird but it, it didn't I don't think it affected me too much mentally or I didn't think it did but I think the isolation I, I find from speaking to other veterans is something that we do have to deal with, you know, we, 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 that's why when we meet another veteran, we sort of like instantly get on no matter what our background is, no matter where, where we've been, what unit we're in, you've got that common ground straight away. Yeah. I think that's what I lack is joining up at a certain age. It can have a profound effect on your mentality so much so that it's very difficult to unwire that kind of hard wiring that goes into your own basic training. It's like mass conditioning. You've got, you know, 30 recruits, and they take you through this process where they just beat you down mentally, physically. So you're all nothing left in the tank. You're, you're, you're low, you're, you're low, you're, you're crap. And then you work together as a team and build yourself up. So you become brothers in that sense. And I think that's where when you come out, you you miss that thing because these people haven't been through that. So you automatically sort of think, well, how can I relate to these people? You can quite easily because you've got common interests, but... I guess maybe part of me is I tend to be more of a, a listen more than talk. Not that you know that right now because I'm ah. gassing like mad. <laughs> but I do tend to, if I meet someone new, I'm in a group, I'm the quietest one in the group. Observe. Yeah. But when you, do you feel as if you've missed a big part of your youth then? Partly, yeah. I've, I've, missed, a, I've missed a part of growing up with my civilian friends where they've all been secure and decent jobs. Some of them are still doing the same job now than than they were you know, thirty years ago. Some of them are some are retired, some have got houses, and I've missed that opportunity because of my lifestyle choices in the forces. They've got themselves nicely grounded. They they've learnt to pay bills from an early age because they thought well, they're going to get a house and they get a share house. They're going to start getting used to paying bills from a young age. They're going to learn to budget their money. Well, if you're a squatter, you get paid on a end of the month, you go and spunk the fucking lot on the weekend, you come back and you're still all right because you've got somewhere to live, you've got so much to eat, you've got people around you to, to, to keep you going. Not much responsibility. Nah, you don't need to. So when you left the army, you went to do close protection? Yeah. How long did you do that for? It was about three years on and off. So basically, when I came out, I went into, my main job was surveillance with my dad. My dad had left the police force by then. So he was working in a team of surveillance with a guy who was ex-special ex forces, ex-SAS. He's, he's gone now, but what a what a fucking guy. Another ex-copper, ex-customs, about three or four of us. And they said, Rich, do you want a job working with us doing surveillance? Because we need someone young that can do the um, the foot follows because we're all fucking old and we can't run anymore. I thought, yeah, all right, I'll do that. That sounds interesting. We'd learned some surveillance with, with the SBS doing the CP course. We'd learned some counter surveillance. So I had a, an idea of how I should do it, but I learned how the police do it. I know the SAS do it. And that's brilliant because you're learning techniques from these different Mixtures. forces. Yeah, yeah, so you combine it all together and, and, and it's great. Some cocktail that. I loved it, mate. It was great. I really enjoyed the, the buzz of something. And you could sit outside someone's house for fucking hours or days waiting. And we had 
the S, I won't say his name, the SS guy, an old Irish guy, was in the van. He was known as the van man. What I do, I drive this van. He'd be in the back already. And it, then he was in his mid 50s. So I drive him down to the plot onto the street, which we would have wrecked a few days before. Like an old plumber's van, I had a, a pipe on the top with those a bit. It looked like a work van. But inside there was an old guy from the SAS sat in there with his camera and his piss bottle and his radio. And uh, I drive into the street and I'd, I'd know where to park it with the back windows facing the house of the target. And I'd get out of the van, I'd lock the van, he'd have a spare set of keys in the van in case he's got a bug out, which does have to happen occasionally. Then I'd wander off down the street and I'd get in my car. So we'd have a couple of cars plotted up, say, either end of the road. So if a car comes out and turns left or right, we can pick up a follow either way. He'd be watching the house. So I'd be sat in this car. And bear in mind, I'm out clubbing Saturdays and uh, Fridays, Saturday nights. So I'm coming down from ecstasy during these surveillance jobs. And I'm fucking tired. I'm really tired. But I'm led there waiting. And we've all got our radios or intercar radios. A bit like the sort of thing the police have, but it's like a closed net. And he suddenly gets standby, standby from the man in the van. He fucking oh, here we go. Fucking all right. Wake up, Rich. Wipe your eyes. Wash your face. Get ready. We're going to get on a follow now. And he would describe the person as a coming out of the house. Yeah, Target is tall white male uh, wearing the blue jeans, white T-shirt, carrying a bag in his left hand, all that sort of stuff. He's getting into a car. He'd give you the registration of the car, the make model registration. And he said he's off, off, off. And that means he's, he's left and it's my turn to start following him. And it's great because it's really exciting because they'll pull out and then you, you think, so how aware are these people? You know, are they are they fully aware? Do they know they're being followed? Are, are they clueless? Do they ever check the mirrors? So we start following and we, we can follow cars for literally hours on end trying to locate where they're going. So a lot of jobs we did were for insurance companies because they're the big players. So if anyone's claiming for, say, a, a bad neck, bad back, can't walk, can't do this, we would be sent by the insurance company to put a three-day surveillance on them to verify if their injuries are, are genuine. So we'd be watching people to see if, they're, if, they have, if they are using crutches, if they have got the neck brace, can they, work, can they walk further than 100 metres to the shops? Can they carry heavy bags, which, which they say they can't carry? And I thought, it's just being a bit of a twat doing this. And I thought to myself, my uncle, that my mum's brother that died, um, he died because he fell off. 40 foot for a roof. He's worked for Sparrow's Cranes. He fell a long way. Injured himself quite badly. He was waiting for an insurance pair to come through, to, which would have saved his life because it would have meant certain surgery, certain facilities in his home and everything else. Had he got the insurance pair slightly prompter, he would have probably still been alive. Not so much now, but he would have lived longer. And I thought the reason it's taking so long is there's so many people that are scamming insurance companies. So that was my justification in my head to do what I was doing because I felt like a right gun. I thought, this person does look really bad. Like they're, they're struck, but they have to go to the shops. They have to carry their bags. So I'm filming and thinking, this is bad. But then I think, thought to myself, well, if they're genuine, we catch it on film, we present that to the courts and they get their pair straight away. If they're not genuine, the people that are, are genuine don't get their money. So I kind of did that for like 18 months, two years. And it was great. I've, someone tried to attack me with a fucking machete. I thought bodyguard work should be dangerous, but the the, the, the surveillance was even worse. So if you get compromised, you're in trouble. You know, if they decide they, they hang on, are you fucking following me, mate? <laughs> Is that how extreme that goes, though, to be watching somebody for three days because of an insurance claim? Yeah. So if they, they used to put a... So anyone out who's trying to get a claim on it, go, bear this in mind. If you're claiming more than 50 grand, they will be watching you. But that is a lot, though. Yeah, that and that lot. was that was twenty odd years ago, mind. Yeah, that yeah, is so a lot. So you can understand. Yeah. So if the claim was more than fifty grand, the insurance companies that we were employed by would warrant a three day surveillance worth a budget of about fifteen hundred quid. It's worth paying for it to know that they can then sort of like quash that claim or or, or pay it out. Mm -hmm. You know. So how does then someone who's been in the army, been raised by a proper father, to be then be surrounded by strong men, mm -hmm. to then become a drug runner? Yeah. So. There was a number of catalysts which hit me and they all happened in a fairly short space of time, probably within about six months of me getting out of prison, out of, prison, out of the army, same sort of thing. Um, the first one was seeing those guys on the podium having a fucking good time, if I want to be a part of that, because they, they've got something going on there. The second one was, a friend of mine was, was going to get our, our pills for us, for all four of us. He was picking up four pills. And after doing this, he was doing this for probably a couple of months. He, he said, look, lads, I can't do it anymore. My head's going, it's, it's too much. Well, for me, it's fucking four pills. I said, I'll do it. 
you know, not really overly bothered. I've done worse. It isn't going to kill me is the attitude that you have in the forces. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll go and get him. So he introduced me to the guy that I had then went and see, seen him. Um, he gave me he gave me the four pills and he saw they're like you know, um, eight quid each. I thought, all right, okay. So I was, he said, make sure you still charge your mate's tenors, mind. All right, okay. I thought, well, that technically means I get mine for free, don't I? Because I've I've made I've made some money on that. So I just started to understand that all of a sudden this business thing just suddenly leapt into my I'd never done any form of business before. It just jumped at me and I thought, ah, oh, right, okay, I understand how it works. So I was doing this for a little while and I thought, so we were getting our pills before we went into the clubs. We had this ritual where we'd, we'd go into the club for about 10-ish, half 10, and we'd sit around the table like this and we'd have our pints there and look at each other, oh, are we going to take our pill yet? Oh, no, let's give it 20 minutes yet. Yeah. No, fuck it, let's do it now. We all knock our pill at the same time. Then we'd wait. We'll start coming, looking at yeah, I'm coming out there. And you'll start looking at each other and start getting excited. And so we had this nice little community going, just just the four of us. But what happened after a few weeks of this this going on, I was approached by someone and said, Oh mate, where'd you get your pill from? I said, Well, you know, um there I was got them outside. So you got any more? I said, No, I ain't got any more. I said, Oh, can you get any? I thought, uh, yeah, probably can, yeah. So I went back and saw the guy the following week. So about getting asked for pills now. There's a number of cases people have said, look, where do you get your pills from? Can we get them? He said, why don't you take some on credit then? Because before I was paying with the cash. I said, well, can I do that? He said, yeah, just take fucking 10. It's only 80 quid. I thought, I mean, I'll make 20 quid. That's got me in the club for free. My pill for free. And back then, I was a couple of points as well. Well, this is all right. So I took these 10 pills, give me mates theirs. Went in the club and they were gone within like, you know, within about half an hour. They were sold, I thought. And these people then started to the ones that were buying the pills started to hang around in the same area in this club. So, all right, okay. So this went from 10 to 20 and it started building up and the people were buying them were hanging around in the same area. So we started to form this little community in the club. And over a space about a year, um, they were building up. It, it peaked at about a couple of hundred. It wasn't going nuts at any stage because that was what was being sold in the club. But then I started selling them outside prior to going in. And I was going, oh, I thought, wow, you know, I've built this little thing. And what I was doing, whether it was deliberate or, or, or not, I was building this sort of community around me of people that made me feel like I belonged. Because we're all off our tits at the same time. We're all having a good time at the same time. We're all enjoying the same music, wearing the same sort of clothes. And we had that common interest, which we all felt the same way. We all felt great at the time, albeit short-lived and quite false. So that kind of replaced that military belonging, which I've missed. I built this thing around me. So no longer was I this satellite on the outside just kind of wishing I was part of something. I was in the middle of it and it wasn't about being the centre of attention. It was about finally being a part of something bigger than just me. And that's what that felt like. So selling those, those pills really sort of like replaced that element of my life that was missing. And it started building up from there. Do you feel as if you would have done anything to just be part of someone and it's be quite part likely. of some group? It's quite likely. Yeah, I, do you know what? It's a sad existence as well to be in, too willing to, mm. whether it's going to the army and fighting or whether it's yeah. doing close protection with your dad, SAS, or whether it's selling drugs or whatever it would have been. Yeah. It's just to bring that surrounding to then, I'll do whatever they're doing just so you will be accepted. Yeah, just just to try and be a part of something, to fit in. So what do you think's missing? It's a good one. I, I think, I think missing from, from an early age... As a kid, I've, I've never quite felt that I was good with groups. So I don't know whether I've got anxiety disorders where I'd isolate myself on purpose. I think I'd like, I, do you know, I just want, I think more people just see me as I am and just be accepted. And I am. But I just think for me, myself, I just seem to be a bit of a nomad. I, I quite like being my own person. But missing my, I think things are different now. I've got my kids now, and that gives me that sense of fulfillment. You know, and that's changed the ball game completely because I've got them and that's my primary focus and no longer am I the most important person in my life. You know, and I think that makes a difference. It, whereas before for me, although I'd do anything for anyone, I'd probably, you know, take a hit for anyone. I was the most important person to me at that time. And now I've got my kids. They are. So my focus is more on, on them and I don't feel like I need to be a part of anything necessarily because as long as they're okay, I feel like I'm all right. Do you know who you are though? No, I ain't got a clue. I've gone for it. <laughs> <laughs> I've gone through. I get it, man. That's I get it. But soldier, you'll, ne I you'll never know who you truly are no. if you're trying to fit in with everybody else. 
Be yeah. who you are. Like, it's okay not to have groups of friends. It's okay mm. not to be doing what everybody else is doing. Yeah. That's the strong ones who stand alone because yeah. they don't give a fuck if yeah. they're accepted or not. Like, yeah. It's difficult because we all want to be accepted. I mm -hmm. want to have a great podcast. I want to have great conversations. Yeah. But really, does it fucking matter? It's a fine balance. As long isn't as it? you're enjoying it. Yeah. I, th I think that the, the two different things is one is trying to, to be a part of something for a certain reason, and the other is trying to fit in. And like you say, I'm, I'm happy now. After seven, half, seven years in jail, I like my own company. I will fleet in and out of people's lives. And I always feel like I'm welcomed, and I am. And people are always welcome to join me in my life. But I'm very happy on my own. You know, I, I don't feel like I need to be mollycoddled or anyone around me to make me feel like I belong anymore. I've I've realised now that I don't necessarily need to be a part of a group. Whereas before, because of the army, it made me feel like I was a part of a group. When it came out, you feel like, well, I need to be in something because that's what I'm used to. But once that's gone, you think, well. You mean you're right. Do I need to be actually involved in this? So maybe I do isolate myself intentionally from groups because I just don't feel like I'm, I just got my own life, my own sort of, my own direction. Maybe you know, know how fast you can get sucked into whatever other people's involved in as well, mm -hmm. whether that's taking drugs or selling drugs. Yeah. So maybe it's a case of, you know what, I'm just going to sit myself tonight because I'm not going to get in trouble then. Yeah, th that's a big part of it. I think it, it's self-preservation, isn't it? You, mm -hmm. you look at the fact of like, how do I know what he's up to? What's his background? What's he doing? You know, the truth is you don't without giving them the, the fucking Spanish Inquisition and saying, right, mate, are you involved in drugs? Because I don't want nothing to do with who you are. Mm -hmm. Safe bet is say, well, just don't talk to no fucker. Stay away from everyone. And, and then I can't get in trouble. I've got another five and a half years on license. 2027 is when it finishes. So I, I've got, I suppose I've got. <laughs> You're better off staying out of close <laughs> just now then, brother. Yeah. Or else we can get a part two in 2030. It's fucking. Yeah. You are playing with fire though. And that's mm -hmm. me only just speaking to you. Yeah. I can already see that with how kind of your mind registers a bit yeah. to be then try to fit in and that's fuck everybody else. Yeah. And I genuinely like fuck everybody else that mm. if you're a loner, be a fucking loner, things change. It's sad because it is a lonely journey. Life yeah. is lonely. Like I'm yeah. travelling down here myself, I, like but I, I, I sit better with my thoughts, but then you feel as if you're missing something. I'm mm. not drinking, but I'll see people watching the football and they're all celebrating when goals go yeah. in. Not obviously when fucking Scotland are playing, but <laughs> you see people see, and you feel as if, part of you feels as if you're missing something. Mm. But I don't miss that because I know how down I get if I do drink and then it leads to yeah. drugs. So I'm safer yeah. myself because I'm, yeah. I'll, I'll try and fit in. Like I can interview anybody. I can yeah. fit in with them, whether it's yeah. a drug dealer, whether it's a fucking nun. Mm. I can fit in. Yeah. That's part of my skill. Same as yourself, you'll be willing to change. Don't yeah. know whether that's part of your surveillance or your close protection yeah. or working with your dad or working mm. with SES to try and fit in yeah. with every surroundings. But that's a dangerous place to be. I, I guess the I guess the thing is, if you're made from a certain mould and you're happy on your own, you're more amiable. I, I can, and people can fit with other crowds. They might not be the right crowd, but it's trying to find the crowd that fit with your model of how you are, you know. And it's quite a bespoke background, isn't it? You know, of all the things that people do. And my, my background is not everyone has gone through that same journey, similar journeys, but not exactly the same. So trying to find someone who can replicate that and be the same mindset as me, with the same kind of characteristics as me, you're never going to find it. So I think... Like you say, it's probably a safer bet just to stay on my own and just avoid <laughs> any. Till your any license is over anywhere. Yeah, at least till January the 12th, 2027. Not that that means anything yeah. to me. So, how do you go from selling just a couple hundred pills to then being charged with two conspiracy charges to then serving 15 years? How did yeah. you move through the ranks? So, and so, the, so, the progression was was gradual, difficult, and stressful. So, in round about 1990, the back in the 96. Now, I lived in a flat, which was at X forces And my friend that when he left the forces with me, the guy that did the CP course with me, he moved down to London. He was doing some work down there. And um, I moved to this flat on Bath Road in Bristol. And it was two Victorian houses converted into six flats. Quite nice, brand new. There's only one couple in and they're on the, they're on the middle floor. I was given the top floor. And... Um, Went there for this is nice. It's all right, it's brand new and it's it's close to town. And I thought to myself, there's fucking like three, four empty flats, there's a ground floor. I was there for about two months. I mean, neighbours moved out from below because I was 
pretty noisy with my parties. I feel awful, but they moved out. They fucked off somewhere else. So it's just me in this six flats on my own. So I rang up my mate from London. I said, mate, where are you living? So I said, mate, there's some flats here. They're empty. X forces. You should get yourself down there. Mate. He was coming down on the occasional weekend to come out with us anyway. It's all right, I'll come down. So we rang up the, the, the housing, housing agency. They allocated him a flat below me, funny enough. So we had these like two flats. So we had two squaddies that would serve together, done the CP course. Both, both used to go out on the piss together, living in this flat. So the party's beginning to become quite rife now because we thought, well, let's go back there because there's no fucker else there. It's just us. We've got the run of these whole buildings. No one's going to complain about the noise. So the party's getting big. And then a few months passed again. It was like the probably beginning of 1997 for argument's sake. And uh, another mate of mine, we just bumped into him. And we said, well, what are you doing, mate? He's on working on the road in the co-op. I'm a manager. You fucking managing that for? So I just stabbed. So we used to, because we were spending our money on drugs and beer, we used to steal, steal food from the co-op and chuck it out the back door for us. We'd fill up my van with fucking stolen food. I said, mate, where do you get down here and live with us? So there's like four flats empty down there. He goes, oh, yeah, fuck it, I'll have some of that. So we moved down here ended up going next door. So out of, again, out of these six flats, we had three occupied. It was fucking nuts, mate. We were just partying all the time. It was just fucking bonkers. So I said to my mate who was in the cop, he'd lost his job. He got sacked, can't think why, stealing food at the back. I said, mate, do you want to partner with me? So I'm selling a few hundred pills a week. It's not much, but do you want to partner with me? And we'll do it together. So I'm in the clubs and I'm selling most of them outside, but I need someone to help me out. So we formed this like partnership. It's going really, really well. So basically the plan was I would hold, I would hold the drugs. He would hold the money. I'd hold the drugs because he was he liked taking them. So he'd end up eating them more than he than he should. The thing is he's also very good at spending the fucking money as well. So either way we were fucked. So what we did in this club is we 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 the same club was selling it is we kind of had this arrangement. By then I really started like started to grow things in there. And we had various people in the club working on side. So we had a manager on site. He'd bring our pills in for us. That's the door sorted. A couple of doormen on site. Perfect. Had that sorted. But the DJ and the lighting jock both on site. So that's the music covered. A couple of bar staff on site. My mate was shagging one of them. So we had that. So I had free drinks all night. So we pretty much had the whole club. I won't use the word so nut because it's quite an old phrase, but we did have it really well covered. Yeah, every, we had every base covered. Mm -hmm. So we'd get the drugs in. The doorman would get our backs if if they were not not so much for trouble, but they'd let us know if, if it was on top and you're going to get a spin. They'd, they'd watch out, we're going to come and search you in a bit. Get the fucking drugs out of the way sort of thing. We just paid them all in pills. One pill to each person. So everyone was happy. So it was going really well. Until my mate was fucking spending the money more than he should do. And we ended up having a few problems because of that. As, as a result, we, we were working with a different firm. I moved on from this one guy I was getting the pills from initially getting from a different firm and it's the first time I had a phone call from someone a debt collector and we're sat there and we'd had a deal with someone as it had gone a bit sour we, we borrowed a grand off someone to buy some pills his name was to turn it around spin it and make him 1500 quid but he kept wanting to take the money back too soon didn't have enough chance to speculate the money and bring it back so basically he killed it before it started so we ended up owing him 500 quid so he sold the debt to this guy we'd heard about this guy and he rang me up this lad, I always say his name, he said, he said, oh, he said, do you know who I am? I said, yeah, I know who you are. He said, you owe me fucking money. I said, yeah, well, so I don't. He said, well, you fucking do, miss. I'll come around to your house now. I'll put you in the boot, doing your fucking legs, and I'm going to take your fucking eyes out. I thought, right, okay, leave it with me. <laughs> so I thought, I spoke to him, mate. I said, mate, we fucked right up here. we got to find 500 quid now. We just spoke the fucking lot. So oh, that for 500 quid? Yeah, mate, that's what, that's what it comes down to, you know? And he told me my address. So I knew he was, I knew the guy. I thought, no, nah, he'll do it. He'll do it. The first time I felt alone, the first time I've been threatened, I actually felt concerned because I thought, where's my fucking muckers? You know, fuck. He, we, we got nothing now. We got, we can't, we cannot beat this guy. We're, we're, we're only just in this game. We're new. We haven't been doing it for a year. We don't know anyone. We've got new contacts. Me and him, we can't beat this guy. So the only money we had was what was left from selling the pills that weekend. We'll have to use that as someone else's money. We'll have to fucking give him that then. So it's another guy's money we paid him. So we went down to this hotel, met him, like that. Give us fucking a there you go, mate. The guy that had done the deal with us was stood there. We didn't even look at him, but you can fuck off, mate. Just give this 
he was a he was a warris fighter. He'd just done warris fighting like fucking proper bare knuckles, and he was a big lad. Give him his dos. He said thank you, and that was it. He walked out, and I saw him a week later on, and he came out. He said, "Mate, fair play. You came through quickly on that one. And if you ever need anything, let me know." And he was just just a business deal for him, and we became really good friends. And then, my mate was spending more money. His spending habits getting out of control. So we had to then point, right, we're going to have to split this, mate. I can't keep working because you're fucking, you're fucking it up. You're getting us in trouble. You know, you, you, we're getting phone calls from money saying, where's my money? He, mate, he said he's got the money and, and he was, he was lying because what he's doing is trying to impress his missus saying that we were in all this dosh, but we weren't earning that much money. We're literally existing. So we went our separate ways. And then when I sort of separated from him, that's when I started to elevate things. So I was selling a bit of pot, selling ecstasy. I was never really bothered with coke until 2002, until about four years later. What I made was, you get involved in the weight? I'd had enough of selling pills. The, the pill market had gone down really badly. For the Mitsubishi's Dove Days. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prior to the Mitsubishi's coming out, they dropped in price. There was a drought, 97, 98, nothing around. Um, the great drought of 97. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think they used to go for like 20 quid then, back then. They used yeah. to go for 20 quid for, I think you can get yeah. free for 10. Yeah, and we were buying it for pence. I was, I would pick up 50,000 and I'd be paying like 20 pence each on them. But you're selling them for fucking 30 pence each because no one's, wants, so you think, oh man, I'm picking up fucking 50,000 gurners. I'm only making like a few hundred quid. But it's still a class A. What's the fucking point in this? This is silly. Yeah, it's penny pinching for a sentence for nothing. Yeah, yeah. So, you, started to sell, so you were selling Ekkies to then... It's different clientele. Ecstasy's yeah. pot. Weed dealers are, are all brand new because they're yeah. just stoners. They don't want any grief. They don't give you any grief anyway. Yeah. Coke's yeah. a different ball game. Smack's a different ball game. Yeah. Angry dealers. Yeah. People want to be gangsters along with it. This is it. So this is the problem I faced. Now, my... Most of my customer base were buying pills. We're slowly graduating from going out clubbing to going to the bars and whatnot, a sniff instead. So they were all looking for, for people to sell coke. But I wasn't interested in doing the grams. I thought, I can't be bothered with that. It's a fucking headache. It's a lot of telephone traffic. It's a lot of meetings, a lot of running around. I've met my wife and got married at this point. We had our first son. I didn't want to be out running around like a nutter selling fucking drugs when I'm meant to be over my, my wife and son so um did you know what you were doing was wrong then but you still wanted to be part of something yeah the sort of right wrong didn't really come into it I, I knew that it was wrong because because I knew but it didn't feel wrong did your, your missus and your son not give you that sense of you weren't alone or are you still feeling lonely still a bit lonely I think I kind of tried to get into the family life, but because of the stress involved was, was selling the drugs at this stage, emotionally I was detached because I was under so much stress. So it doesn't allow you to engage with people as, as well as you'd like to because you might be I might be in the same room with me, me missus and my son at the time, but I could be thinking about, how oh, the fuck am I going to raise this money? He's not paid again or there's this problem here. I've got to go and sort this out. One thing after another. And that's before the coke started. I thought, well, this is fucking daft. I'm making a few hundred quid on all these pills. I, I, I need to do it. So I spoke to all of the people that I knew were buying grams. I said, who are you getting your stuff off of? And I was trying to figure out where they were getting the stuff from and how could I start. So I didn't want to fuck around with anything. Part I want us to do it in corners or nines or quarter keys. And eventually found enough people to find that I could sell ounces to, but take on a quarter key. Was it proper? Yeah, well, no, not after we finished with it. You dance on it? Yeah, it started off. So I spoke to my mate, the guy that I first bought pills from. He was now well into the coke scene. So he was my in. He had the contacts. So we said, right, I said, I said, I rang, I said mate, I want to get involved in this. I said, I want to work with you. I know you're doing a bit. I said, but let's not fuck around. Let's do it properly. Let's let's get a press. Let's get a mould. Let's make it all up. You get? Can you get the real one? He said, yeah, I can get that. So let's get the fucking cutting agent. Let's just do it. Let's dance on it. Let's step on it. She says, yeah, fuck it, we're up for that. So we did. And me and him set up a little place where another guy showed us how to do it. All the, the moulds are just mental. It's like a tube, like a stainless steel tube out of aircraft, fucking stainless steel. Weighed a fucking ton. And the first time I've ever seen proper coke was when this guy dropped a kilo around and sat on that and we opened it, took the rubber jackets off of it and all the fucking tape and all the the, the plastic which were pressed onto it and peeled it away and it's just like like a grainy look on there. So I thought... Fucking hell, look at that. 
but back then it was only about 28 grand thereabouts this was in 2002 many did you get out at for the four no no only t- we only hit it twice so we got three yeah yeah only three out of three out of one no three two yeah three two out of so you had three yes yeah, so what we, were you selling name at I don't 15. know what he's selling this for. No, he he was he was putting us out in nines. I don't know what he's selling this for. I think we've I've valued it at something like about seven grand a corner, I think. Which about seven K. Which wasn't too bad. That's a good markup. And it was about twenty five percent, thirty percent. It was coming in at about between eighty five and ninety, mm-hmm. give or take. You know, so it was good kit. And I'd never seen it before. When we broke it, I was like, fucking hell, that's just so shiny. It's glistening. How was it the first time breaking it up and pressing it? Oh, it was mental. Yeah. It was just messy. It, well, we were very aware of the fact that it. it just every, had masks on? No, no, we didn't. We, <laughs> no gloves, nothing. Yeah. Just, just fucking as we were. <laughs> and it was in someone's front room. And we, we, we'd we learned quickly to put a tarpaulin on the floor because mm-hmm. Coke's got a good way of disappearing into a carpet. If you drop it, it's just boof. Yeah, you're, wa- you're wasting grams, man. Yeah, that's that's money, and mm-hmm. and that's that difference of that. I mean, I've had someone who's dropped a whole ounce of mix on the floor into a shag pile carpet. And fucking yeah, just, it's gone. just just goodbye, mate. Yeah. Just say goodbye to it. What were you mixing it with, Ben's? No, back then it was Manitol. We we didn't. Ben's wasn't on the scene then. We couldn't find it. No one. We we could have accessed possibly lidocaine or novocaine, but we heard it was a bit volatile with with the mix. So we using Manitol. We were paying five hundred quid. And we think it's something to do with horses. We're not sure what it was, but it was white and it did the job. Ketamine? No. Nah, it would have been out. There were fucking no. people would have been out it was, it, was, it was a benign substance. It didn't actually do anything. It was just a powder. We'd have been better going straight to fucking Holland and and getting a tub of creatine. Would have done the same job. So back then it was, it was Manitom. And we were told it's because it presses up and it bonds well and it gets firm. But the fact is you put some of the 10 tons of pressure, mate, it's going to fucking firm up. It's going to be hard and solid. But the reality is... It doesn't matter what it looks like, but it's a perception people have got. If they get a bag of powder, they think it's been cut. Well, it could be a lump, but it's already been cut, mate. It doesn't matter what yeah. it looks like. So started off with Manitol. And it just built then. It kind of, but it it was a rocky road because I was doing about a nine and it slightly went up a little bit. It went down a little bit and it fluctuated a little bit. I was still buying pills in because people wanted pills. I was still selling pots. I was selling all sorts of stuff. And then... It was just a wavy fucking road and it was messy. And I think things started going wrong about 2005. That's when I wrote, that's when I wrote, I was featured a book, it's 2006. What's the book called? Charlie Four Kilo, ironically. My two favourite letters in the phonetic alphabet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go on to that in a bit if you want. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, touch on it now. Oh, yeah. So I'll tell you what then, I'll give you a present. <laughs> as long as that film doesn't get busted mate do you imagine what it's like for me driving up the um, motorway with that in the back Absolutely. you might not get into it as well right? that's where you used to get boxes back in the day yeah yeah well that's when I send out signed copies so, so is that I... your book yeah that's it yeah, yeah. see if you get pulled with the coppers with us mate you'd have been fucked <laughs> with the man straight away straight in jail mate so this is your first book first book of series of four and you wrote this while you were active no, I wrote this when I was when I was coming out of jail. I started off writing when I came out of prison. And then, because I had access to a laptop, uh-huh. finished it off last year. Because I had to get used to being out of jail, settling with family and that. Where can people get this book? On Amazon, mate, or if they want I'll to. I'll leave the link in the description. Yeah, no worries, mate. Like, at the minute, I'm doing signed copies on email, but Amazon's your main place. So, in, in deep, in day, and into the dark underworld of drugs and organised crime... Discover how Jones, the lost soldier, uses his specialised military training in a world most people fear. Interesting, brother. Mm. So check that out, guys. I'll leave the link in the description. Written in crowns because I'm a squaddy. <laughs> <laughs> so you were still... So why, what gives you the... So going through that, cutting it up, getting two or three boxes, getting a bit of paper in it, it's a good turnover. Yeah. Is that when you started... What was the feeling then for you? Because the if I'm buying gear off you, mm. I know you're going to be reliable straight away. You're always going to yeah. be on time. You're going to pay your debt. Yeah. You're always going to be 100%. Yeah. You always know. Yeah. Even, that's, yeah, that's the worst of it. Like, I was active back in the day. Yeah. Which I'll get into when I touch on my own story, but yeah. you knew who was going to fuck you over. Yeah. And even the ones who fuck you over, you still gave them graft. Because yeah. part of you thinks... You got that little bit of faith. Yeah. He might not fuck it, it up this time. It's a bit of faith <laughs> and greed. Yeah, but every time they fuck you over, there's yeah. more graft. Yeah. Work it off. The bill gets fucking higher. Yeah, it just increases, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, time, and that's exactly it. And that's what was going on with with the coke game. Is I'm, 
I've got a threshold of where I would see it, and I've, I get asked this a lot. At what point, if someone owes you money, do you fucking run in there and start, you know, reclaiming that debt by any means necessary? And I think, well, I've got a threshold. At what point would you say it's worthwhile getting the police kicking your door off because you fucking had to kidnap someone? Or at what point is it worthwhile you doing someone that much harm that they've got no choice than to go to the police because they're fucking terrified of what might go on and then you lose everything? It's a threshold. So I found that that threshold was breached on a few occasions and I, and my initial thing was someone owes me money, I give them the benefit of the doubt, but I walk away. I walk so how away do you deal with that then to be then, because you don't want to be a pushover in that game because no, then everybody fucks right. your left, right and centre. Yeah. So how do you deal with that then if you never had that ruthless, men ruthless mentality? Was that other people you were surrounded with who dealt with that? Yeah, well, generally speaking, if 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 I couldn't manage, if I wasn't prepared to go and sort of doubt it myself, there'd be other people who'd be more than happy to go. You'd, you'd sell a debt 50%, you know, and that's, that's the game. I just doubled the debt. So right, there you go, mate. He owes me, instead of 10 grand, he owes me 20 grand. Go and deal with it. It didn't have to happen. There was a couple of people, the main money that was owed was when I went to prison is when people sort of, the, the net is cast out and people just fucking run to all four corners and hope they don't get caught. And they usually run owing money. You know, so that's the only real debts that were owed. There were debts here and there. But nothing that wanted me wanted to go in there and actually think, right, you can't you owe me fucking five grand, I want it. It wasn't worth the fucking hassle. Did Cut you, loose. Yeah, did you ever have a number in your head that was enough to get out, to make you happy, to keep your family yeah. okay life for the next 50, 60 years? I think the number was, it was the business because I think the numbers were never going to hit the point where you could have it. Retire? Sat there in a bank because it wasn't going to happen. Because bear in mind, my my... Business really took off in 2008. I'd gone through some major shit, 06, 07, beginning of 08. Proceeds of crime and start, was starting about then, eh? 2002, pocket yeah. came out. So that's when people were getting scared. That's when assets were difficult to, to hide. So you had to be really clever of how you did things. You had to be really careful about how you made money, how, how you potentially laundered it, how you would filter into the bank, you know, buying goods, you know, due diligence, bank clerks fucking car sales rooms everything that's operate with due diligence now so spending money is really hard so you have to be really really premeditated and plan it way way ahead and you, and you can't plan what you're gonna earn from one week to that you, you can you can presume you're gonna sell this much and you might make that much but it's not guaranteed so you can't premeditate what you might earn because you might not or you might take a massive fucking loss one loss and you're fucked three five yeah. years five years works fucked yeah you 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 could you could take on Two kilos costing you a hundred grand, say for argument's sake. You could make 30, 40 grand on that. You could make more. But that gets nicked, that's hundred grand in the hole straight away. So that 30, 40 grand you make is totally irrelevant. It doesn't mean anything. It means nothing because you now got a hundred grand debt. See, when you were doing this, was your dad never in your psyche? Was it your dad never in your mindset? Always. Being that kid who was in the army, having his tears in his eyes to then mm. becoming a fuck up? Every single fucking day. I was worried that if he finds out what I've turned into, he's never going to forgive me. Neither will anyone else, let alone my dad. And my dad was the one that I worried about the most. His his opinion is one that really mattered. I cared about my wife's opinion. I cared about my mum's. My dad's, I really cared about. Because it mattered about what he thought about. Because he, like you say, he was proud of me when I joined the force. He was proud of everything I did. you know. And then he's kind of like, if he, fuck, if he finds out what I've turned into... Not, it's not a case of like, he won't talk to me, but he'll see me differently. I didn't want that. Disappointment. You know? Yeah, that's worse than it. I'm not angry, son. Yeah, I'm you'd rather take a beating yeah. than having, I'm disappointed. I'm very disappointed with yeah. you, son. <laughs> so when you're going through that then and moving through the ranks, doing bigger bits, when did you start getting surveillance on you? Did you not notice or did you have, or were you just too caught up mm, in the game? Yeah, so basically what happened is um, 2009, there was a chap that was, I got to the point where I didn't have to have hands on, which was nice. You know, I'd employed people to do various roles within that group, if you like. One of the guys was, was he was my manager. He managed it for me. So we'd meet up every morning, about half six, me, him, another guy. We'd go through what we're going to do for the day. It wouldn't be every day, sorry. It'd be like when, when things are due in, it's arriving here. I want this doing, I want that doing. Here's the customer's jump on it mate so he was in the thick of it he knew everything about it and um, so it went tits up for him in September uh, 2009 
basically interesting story ish he lived in the middle of nowhere with his um his girlfriend and, and their family and they owned a business uh selling plants not not illegal although there was <laughs> although there was illegal plants uh-huh. involved it was actually a, a nursery garden where they sell like cuttings um, of fucking flowers and stuff mm. like that um but also he did have other plants growing in the basement now this evening what happened the place had just shut he wasn't there he was off he was off working somewhere else and a group of local lads or local were aware that there was this crop was due down or it was down being ready to come out it was dried ready to go so they came in tooled up once the place is shut and they held him up at gunpoint so right where's the fucking plants we know you've got them here give him a slap with the gun so what's happening the guy's missus who's fucking shitting herself she rings the lad up that I know and says look we're being robbed please fucking come and do something we're being fucking robbed here so he's then jumped in his van he's got a taser in the van and he drives there as quick as he can to go and fucking try and save them as, uh, try and rescue them unbeknown to him someone else had seen these three guys looking suspicious walking into this building they rang the police which they would you know, why wouldn't they so uh this lad turns up, I'm trying not to say his name. This lad turns up like a knight in shining armor with his fucking taser to be greeted by the police that have been called because of an armed robbery. So they presume he is part of this armed, armed robbery. The armed robbers are gone. They've done the deed. They've got, I think, they presume they got what they wanted and they fucked off. But he turns up with a taser and straight away they thought, oh, we've got our man. So they've arrested him. He's got a class two firearm on him. So they arrested him. They searched his house, found nothing, searched a building associated with him and found a press, moulds, cutting agents, no coke, but traces of cocaine on the stuff. And they give him a good grilling. Now at the time, we didn't know what where this was going to go. We just we just found out that he'd been arrested and he's been they'd seized money off of him as well. So we thought, oh, fucking hell, we're fucked. They found they found our, you know, where we do the coke. Yeah. And he's released on bail. He can to supply. Yeah, that's it. Well, e- even more so. Luckily, he didn't find any coke, so he couldn't actually pin anything heavy. But they've mm-hmm. they've grilled him. So he's come out and said, oh, it's all right, lads. Everything's okay. It's all right. It's sort of. They haven't found any drugs. We're, we're a bit of a caution. for thought, okay, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. He's a fucking snitch, mate. Yeah, yeah, straight yeah, away. If you're so, getting so a we, place and that, you're fucked. Yeah, they've got, and they've taken his money. Did you believe him, though? I wanted to believe him, but part of me thought, not really sure about this. So I thought, right, okay, let's let's be tactical about this. So this was in September 2009. So nothing happens. A few months pass, a few months pass, and we thought, oh, we get back to normal again. Well, nothing's come on top. No one's been arrested. Business as usual. So we're getting to 2010. So 2010 was, was a, started off as a really fucking good year because I just had plans now to, to, the exit was ready. I could see the fucking light. I thought, well, that's my way out. I'd started the motorsport, motorsport business in 2008. I was doing my track days. I was doing my racing in 09, 2010. The plan was to open a garage and to develop cars for motorsport. That was that was my that was my dream. It wasn't a load of money. It was during a recession. So money was tight everywhere. So to be flush and extravagant during a recession would bring heat. an unnecessary heat on me. So I had to be very contained how I did things. So having lots of money around me in the bank wasn't a healthy thing to do. So I had to invest it into building this business, which I did. So we got the garage done. So that was being built during the summer of 2010. And um, everything was going fucking well. And and the garage opened up on the 1st of October. And the plan was the guy that was managing it, he was going to take over my business, the drugs business. I said, look, mate, all I want to do, I just need some money off you each month to cover the overheads on the garage. I could fit all that in quite easily. That's not a problem. Just chuck us about, I think about four grand a month to cover the wages, the rent, and a few bills. The rest can be made up from customers. I said, after that, you can have it, mate. You know, just just keep me going. So this is self-sufficient. Well, yeah, no worries. So we'll, we'll, we'll do that. And um, we got into the, um, October 2010. We were sort of plowing through. I thought, oh, this is fucking great. It's all right. It's been a big opening day. All the cars were down there. And it was all there. It, it was going all right. Yeah, it wasn't loads of custom because it was a recession. But my dream was coming true. You know, I finally found something which ticked all the boxes. You know, the, the, the drug dealing ticked the boxes because it kept me entertained it, it gave me an income it gave me the risk it, it did everything i needed to satisfy my cravings of leaving the forces and the motorsport did the same thing 
did the income or moderately, um, certainly gave me the risk of racing and, and it, it had the structure as well. And then um, October 28th, uh, one of my runners was delivering some coke and he got arrested, got pulled on the motorway. We didn't know at the time by armed police. And we found out, basically I found out because he hadn't turned up to his destination. He was due, due to go to one place and the guy rang us, oh, where, where's your mate? He's not here yet. I said, oh, fuck this mate, he should be with you by now. He said, no, he's, he's not around. I said, well, any, any ideas? Can you, you know, if you try court, he said, he's not answering. I thought, fuck it, I thought, I don't want to ring him, but I need to ring him. So I rang him, nothing, kept ringing, nothing, oh, fucking hell. So I rang him for, maybe he's done it in reverse order. So I ran the guys down south, he was going down, down the motorway down the M5. I said, mate, have you seen him? He said, no, nah, no, nah, nothing, we heard fuck all. I thought, fuck sakes. My only thing I thought was, we'd had a bit of an argument that day, and he was due to go to France the following day. We thought maybe he's just fucking for a fuck it. I'm just gonna fuck off and go to France and not deliver the stuff and you know, just just you know just bin it. I thought that was plausible because we'd had we'd had heated words. I thought maybe he's just for fuck it. In which case, that's the better of the two options. So I thought I'd keep ringing. So I sent him a text saying, "Look, mate, mate, I appreciate you're upset. I hope you get to France okay. I hope your journey's sane. I just worried about you know. Make sure you're okay. Make sure you're safe. Don't do anything stupid." No response. Didn't even go through the phone. Had gone off by then. I thought fucking hell. And then the next day, I was like fucking stressing out. And my mate rang up. He said, have you heard the news? I went, no, I said, oh, been, he's been arrested. It's on the news. So there's a car was pulled off the M5 um, with armed police. Uh, the occupant was found with one and a quarter kilos of cocaine and, and money. I thought, oh, fucking hell, he's been nicked. And I thought to myself, right, is that part of the bigger picture? Or is it just him? Has he fucked up? Because yeah, he, he did have a marker on his car because I didn't realise he'd been involved in a road rage. So I thought, fucking hell, maybe his road rage has caught up with him and they just randomly found his drugs. And I'm trying to justify all these different reasons why he might have got arrested. And the reality is I should have known that it was on top, but at the time I think, ah. Oh. So I thought, right, the wise thing to do is just shut shut down. I spoke to all the guys, said, look guys, shut it down. It's on top. I think, we think we're gonna be in trouble. I think there's an investigation going on. We can't risk it even if there isn't. Let's just close up for now. See what happens. I spoke to the guys that, that was managing it. I said, mate, we're shutting down. He said, oh, no, you'll be all right. I said, no, nah, mate, that's it. I'm shutting down. He said, are you sure? I said, yeah, 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 shutting down. So a few weeks passed, and he goes, mate, do you want to get up and running again? Yeah, I said, no, nah, mate, I'm all right. I'm going to fucking leave it. He said, well, just, just do a little bit. I said, no, nah, mate, I've had enough. I was thinking, I'm fucking broke. You know, the, the garage is doing really badly because it was now a cold winter. Winter 2010 was fucking freezing. We had that big snowstorm come in. The heating alone was fucking like seven fifty every every month because we had an old oil burner. Couldn't even afford to pay that. I can't afford to pay wages. Well, fuck, I need to earn some money rapidly. So I rang. I said, "Look, mate, let's, let's have a look at it." So I got another runner for you. So all my other guys had jumped ship, which is fair enough. I wouldn't expect them to stay on board. And um, I got another guy, and I said, "Right, yeah, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to send you down south, pick up some coke, get it back to me. I'm going to turn it into a fucking." There's only half a nine, four and a half ounces is all it was. I said, I can get that, turn that into fucking, you know, a kilo <laughs> if I need to and just fuck it out the door, make yourself two or three grand and then just fucking pay the bill and pay some wa pay some wages, keep people happy. So then this guy down the road and then he, on the way back, he got pulled as he's going on to the M4. Oh, fuck's sake. So he's been pulled. That's another, that's another runner literally a month later and that was the end of November. So I thought, fucking hell, he's been nicked. I said, that's definitely, definitely, that's it. We're definitely being investigated. So um, I shut down again. And then that was it. The, even the guy that was trying to get me to do it, he said, no, nah, just, just leave it. You know, I think he's on top. So I did. Then I had a phone call on the 30th of December from a lad that used to, he was a mate and he used to buy an ounce every now and again, like mate's rates. He said, oh, mate, it's New Year's Eve tomorrow. I said, can we do anything? I said, I said mate, I'll fucking shut down. That's it, we're done. You know, it's not happening. I said, I said, well, mate, it's New Year's Eve. Please, can you do anything? I said, well, look, I'll give me mate's number. He's still he's still trading. Just give him a shout. So around me, mate, I said, look, it's all right. I said, yeah, that's no problem. So I give him the numbers. 31st comes, I sat and work in my garage. And then I just thought, leave him to it. And I had a phone call about, it must be very sort of mid-afternoon. And there's a guy that wanted it. He said, oh, where's, where's your mate? I'm trying to ring him. I said, oh, have you, you just keep trying him. You'll get through. And then my phone rang again. It was the other guy that had, that had the coat. I said, I can't get hold of your mate. I said, he's trying to ring you. Well, they both fucking rang me now, haven't they? That's that's that triangle. Connection. That connection between two guys. 
I didn't think anything of it. I just thought, it's fucking idiots to get on with it. And then I didn't, that was it. I went, I had a New Year's Eve. Um, that night, I had the phone rang about 10 o'clock. And um, it was him, the guy I bought there. He said, I just got out of the police station. I thought, oh, fucking hell, not another one. So he got nicked. But that was because there was a surveillance on, on the other guy. And I thought, well, that's it. It's definitely, we are definitely being investigated, 100%. So that was the last thing, I, last coat I had anything to do with was December the 31st. 2010. That's and the last one. charges? Conspiracy? Yeah, so some months passed. Uh, April the 14th, 2011. And I was just playing the waiting game. I just thought that it's going to happen. And part of me thought, well, maybe it's not. Maybe I've just kind of got away with it. Because the first run, I mean, mate that got pulled the previous year, he was due for sentencing. He just picked up six, six years, six months. I thought, that's a bit harsh. And then... um. I sat in my garage, I sat on my desk like this, like a look out through the door onto the, like a hard standing car park where all the, the, the cars would park up. And I could just see like a little letterbox view out through the door. It was a nice warm morning. Sat on the computer and I just, at my peripheral, I saw fucking three dark cars just sort of sail past the door and I thought, a little bit fucking ominous. But there was other businesses on that estate, so maybe they're just me. But then I noticed that the back one had stopped I could just see the back it's three focuses I thought this is it they're fucking here now this this is this has got to be the arrest they're, they've come now for me but it seemed quite surreal because I thought well are, are they really for me and I thought well, let's just pop out and have a look and see so I walked out and I seen like three cars sort of debussing with like uh, police in, in suits not uniform I thought this looks pretty fucking serious so I, I said good morning I said good morning how you doing I saw Rich Jones I said yeah, it's right, you're under arrest for... You know, obviously, he came up to me and said, so you're under arrest for a conspiracy by cocaine. Uh, sorry, cons conspiracy by Class A, namely cocaine. Anything to say for... Oh, nah, mate. And that was it. That was the first arrest, and it was soccer. You know, so it Serious was, crime squad. Yeah, so I thought, it's, it's definitely a fucking... And as you said earlier, conspiracy is the one. When when I first started, my mate that saw me with his first four pills, said, oh, if you get caught... You get three things that it's, it's going to be possession, possession with intent. You could probably, you know, you're not too bad on that. But if they say conspiracy, you're fucked. When they say conspiracy, I thought, I just, that memory just fucking jumped out. So I'm fucked <laughs> straight away. How many people were on your charge sheet? So it was, this is where it gets cut more moderately complicated. So on that one, the even the Somerset um, soccer, there were, about five or six of us, I think. Say about six for argument's sake, because I can't, if I go through the names, I'm going to say a name by mistake, and I don't want to do that. So about six people on that charge sheet, which doesn't seem that many. No, I think there was maybe seven. And what you don't realise at the time is when you get nicked and you sat in the police station, you think you're there on your own, don't you? You think I'm just, it's just me. Because you know, there's no noise, no one kicking doors or no one kicking off making any racket. And then you get called through for your interview and you sit down, they show you the, the uh, indictment and they, they show you the, the, the initial disclosure. And you look at the names and you think, fucking hell, they've got it. Oh my God, they've got, they've got him as well. And you start thinking, oh, fucking hell, how far has how far this net been cast out? Pick that lad down south, the one, you know, fucking hell, they've got everyone. And there's names you don't recognise because you don't know them by the real name. You might just got my code name or a nickname. You think, Fuck me, this is, this is bad. They've got a lot of us. There's one name I didn't see on there. There's a guy that was managing it for me. I thought, maybe, oh, he's, he's a lucky bastard, isn't he? He's got away with it. Yeah, so the pen is beginning to sort of drop a little bit on that one. He had a snatch? Yeah. Yeah, we believe he was. Because he got his money back that was seized. And there was no charges brought forward for the taser, which is a class two firearm. That's like a... That's a free issue as well. We yeah, can get a sentence for that. Sense. Yeah, straight yeah. away. Yeah. So yeah. how was it going through yeah, the, the interview? Oh, I like a fucking idiot. Right, the first interview, I say first, I was arrested again later. Um, now, this is where me being the son of a fucking policeman comes into the difficulty side of things because I'm thinking to myself, try and talk your way out of it. Sort of, yeah. I've, not going no comment all the way. No, I'm a prick. No, Why I did you know? not? But you sure as fuck you should have known by your old do, boy. Do, do you know what it was? I thought to myself, oh, man, I just feel stupid saying this. I didn't want to come across as someone that, that was a criminal. Because of that, I created this persona in front of my family, in front of my dad, in front of people that I knew that I wasn't. And I was really good at it because no one knew. 
you know, so I, I thought, let's carry that on for now. And I thought I can do, and, I, and do you know what, stupidly, I really like the idea of a challenge. And I know it's my life I'm playing with, but I love the idea of thinking, can I fucking wing this? I didn't give anyone any name. I didn't drop anyone to shit apart from myself. Yeah, that's the, the main thing. As soon as you open your mouth, no matter if you're not mentioning names, you oh, mention yeah. a destination, somebody you're connected with, you're fucked. Yeah. No matter the association, no matter the connection, as soon oh, as you yeah. open your mouth, you are fucked. Yeah. Simple as. Yeah. But you being you have tried to speak your way out of not realising you're just fucking digging your own grave oh, and mate. getting more, more years added to your sentence. Yeah. Well, the, ir the irony was, um, I won't go into the, into that yet, but yeah, mm. that that is what undid me in the end. It doesn't mean it would have changed the result yeah, come. But, but it means i gave them the ammunition i needed. gave them because the, at the end and it was a really good interview i mean i i, I run parallels with everything you know to, to make things plausible you know so every person that i knew who i sold drugs to and i mean everyone i didn't have that many customers because when you're selling more you, you you have less people in your book maybe five customers every single one of those customers i ran as a, a a legitimate parallel with them. They were a customer at the garage. I tuned their car. I'd done this for them. They used to buy car parts. So there was always a parallel. Yeah, but even though you think you're covered, oh, that's yeah. still a connection. Yeah. That's still a connection. You could yeah. be meeting anywhere. You could bump into them for lunch and it could be an accident. Yeah. But if you have filmed that, their photos took with you surveillance with them. That's it. It's like still a connection. Yeah. Like people it, that came out and home leaves. Yeah. They speak to someone in the street that they've just actually bumped into. Yeah. They can do a recall. For yeah. association. Oh, yeah, because I make an assumption that yeah. there's something going on. So see, when you were getting your interview, did a part of you feel as if you were letting your dad down, your family down, but you thought you were smarter than the system instead of being... Yeah, it, it was a level naive. of arrogance. Yeah. There was a level of arrogance. I wouldn't say arrogant in the sense of... No, it was arrogance. It was. I, I thought I could do it. I thought I could do I could do this. And in reflection, yeah, what a fucking idiot. You know, that's why my other interview was significantly different to that. But part of me thought that I, I thought I could beat it because I still had that military thing in me saying, you can, you, you can do this, you can achieve anything, positive thought, you can do it. And that, that military thing in there saying, fuck it, you're better than this, you're better than this. And if, if I'd have known, if I'd have had a, if I could have forwarded a decent brief, they'd have said, do not say a fucking word. You know, I would have listened to them, but the brief I had said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'll be right. He said, are you sure? Yeah, I'll be fine, mate. I'll be fine. He should have said, "Don't be so fucking daft, mate. Keep yeah. your mouth shut. Don't say a word." But I didn't get that <laughs> advice. Yeah, if I'd had someone a bit, a bit more stern with me, I said, "Do not say nothing." I would have listened to them and thought, mm -hmm. "Okay, I don't. Oh, it goes against the grain, but I'll do as you say." No matter how tough you are, though, sitting in the, in the cop, sitting in the chairman, two coppers, good and bad, playing you like a fucking fiddle. Yeah. People's asses go. Mm. people's asses go it's scary because you're thinking fuck me they're threatening you with 15 20 years mm. people just go fuck it i want out of here because yeah. the pressure the the closed environment the yeah. smell but i loved it that's the worst mm -hmm. thing i enjoyed that i enjoyed that process i liked the same as i enjoyed the court process i liked the the buzz it gave me because i knew that i was risking your life yeah i, f I felt it was all right i thought yeah i know i'm gonna be fine i know i'm in trouble but I like teetering on the edge of that fucking knife edge. I know that this is where, that's where I like to be. I like to be in that little zone where if you go that way, you're right. If you go that way, you're fucked. I like living on that edge. What is that then? It just It's just me. I just like, the closer to death I, I am, the more alive I feel. Adrenaline junkie? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Do you ever do skydiving, rock climbing, stuff like that? All that, yeah. Having to push yourself to the extreme? Yeah. What about, have you ever been tested for anything? Like, I don't know. Anything like, because I had a, a big guy on, uh, George King, great guy. He climbs buildings. Yeah. He doesn't really sleep much. But that's when he feels, he feels more at peace when he's fucking hanging from a building, a skyscraper. Yeah. He climbed, climbed the Shard and Did he? London. Again. What, free? Yeah, just his hands. Oh, man. Just climbed up it. That's Obviously, nice. it takes a bit of preparation, but, us, yeah. but living on that mm. edge, no yeah. frogs, but I think he'd been diagnosed with something. Can't yeah. remember what it is. Maybe I think that's ADHD, what part of the, whatever. Part of the drug taking was that as well, because you 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 know you're dicing with death, aren't you? Yeah. You take a pill, you knew it you, you it could be a lottery. You know, and a part of that was that I'm mm -hmm. still alive. So and things you experience in the forces, they, they put you to a point where you, you could be taken at any moment. I mean, I was lucky, I didn't see any kinetic activity. I was lucky. My service was between the wars. I was I did Northern Ireland, but I didn't get shot at I was nearly blown up on a couple of occasions but and even then you think fucking hell this is this is amazing 
because I love the thought of of that close shave. Have you ever been suicidal? Oh yeah, yeah. Just just on just the ones I know it took me life in uh, two thousand and five six back in the six. Get me dates right. Yeah, back in two thousand and six. What happened? Is all linked with with that with the in fact it's the last chapter on that one. The the stress of debts. You got too much. I was literally. I just I just I'd given up. I had a mental breakdown. I was in fucking bits, and um, I'd had enough. I just wanted to die. I wanted out. I just wanted out. I, I needed to get rid of the pain. Um, so I was drinking, and I was I was just no good. I was just I was no good to my missus. I wasn't horrible, but I just wasn't there mentally. I was was not in the room, and to try and feed a young boy and a and a baby. My my youngest was just a baby at the time. Couldn't support them because there was no money. It was horrendous. You know, I was in a bad way, and I was scratching around trying to find money to pay this massive debt off from from the the keys, the kit, the coke that was taken by the police. I got the point where fuck it, I can't do it anymore. So I, I said to myself, right, I'm gonna go to the doctors, and I did. I actually went to the doctor, and I thought, I want help. I don't want to die, but I feel like I'm, I feel like it would be the, the 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 way out right now. Take away the pain. I went to the doctors, and I fucking just burst out of tears and I tried like, uncontrollable tears I'm not just talking like a little weepy weepy it was fucking I couldn't speak I felt like I was four years old and I'd fallen over it was that bad I couldn't stop and he said he said can you get to the hospital I said yeah he said are you can you get there because I'm worried about it I said I can it's, it needed to go there and get myself checked in and assessed so I thought now I know that I'm going to get help I'm okay I don't want to do it but I'm I, I still still tempted so got to the hospital, French hospital in Bristol, and I, and I explained the situation, told them that the business had gone out, of, it had gone parasitic because of the recession. I couldn't sell old money for Coke. It didn't really, wasn't going to fit, was it? So I said, look, my business is struggling, which it was. The reality was the garage was struggling at that stage. Oh, sorry, not the garage wasn't open. My business was was struggling. I had no money. Um, that's right, okay, we'll get a doctor to assess you and say you've, you've got moderate to severe depression from what we can tell. So we'll get you on some antidepressants. So look, stay here tonight under observation. And then, you know, tomorrow we'll get you to the doctors and get your, your antidepressants. Oh, okay. So that night was weird. I just led there thinking about my life, where I'd, where I'd ended up, you know, how did I get into this position, reflecting on, the, I suppose, reflecting on the time in the army, but more so reflecting on how, how shit a dad was I when I can't really be there for my missus and my son, and my, oh, sorry, my, my sons. So the morning came and then it was like back to reality. I thought, fucking hell, I've got to put my phone on now. I switched my phone off the night before and I was meant to be delivering stuff and rounding money up. But when that phone goes on, I'm going to get a fucking barrage of fucking hate mail from the person that I owe this money to saying, where's my fucking dough? Where is it? And I wasn't scared of him, but when I owe money, I owe money. That's it, isn't it? If you owe debt, you pay it regardless of what you've got to do. And I, let, I pushed the point where I was ready to, to fucking do anything to pay that debt off. So I sat in the car and I was looking at the phone and thinking, oh, I can't, can't do it. So I had a knife, a little fucking boot knife. Not for anything like attacking me, but it was just in there. And I grabbed it and I sat and put it on my fucking wrist and I thought, and I was pushing really hard on my wrist and I thought, I'm going to do it. I could see bits of blood appearing where I was just cutting the outer layer of the skin. I just thought of my boys and I thought of my sons and I thought, this is no way for them to grow up without a dad. I just put a knife down, fucking threw it on the deck, and that was it. I was like, I was probably, if my sons hadn't popped into my head at that time, I'd have done it. I think I'd have probably done, gone through with it. Scary place to be. Yeah, it was. But after that had happened, you feel a release. Yeah, because I'd I'd already been as low as I could be. And we've we've seen this thing, and we do a lot of mental health. We know there's two points where you're at your most dangerous. Is they draw a curve. Like this, like a U bend, and draw a line across it like that. So, what point are you most likely to kill yourself? Most people say, well, when you're at the very bottom, to know it's going to be either there because you haven't hit your lowest yet, or there on the way up because you feel you've got too far to go. When you're there, the only way really is up. It keeps on getting better, and that's why I was at that lowest level there. And I thought, right, that's as bad as it's going to get for me. I started climbing back up again, and then what changed was getting on the old fucking happy pills on the antidepressants mm -hmm. because they were the treat for me. I responded well. Minor dose of um, fluxetine, 20 milligrams a day. Green and yellow pill, fucking lifesaver for me because it gave me, it put, a, it literally put a spring in my step. And so for like a year, I'd been stressing like fuck. I was in, it wasn't, it was about six months, 
seven months I've been in a bad way, stressing, chasing money. And these antidepressants for me took away that sense of like, I can't face the world anymore. And I could face the world again, I could deal with it. And that's when it changed. I started telling the guy that opened the money, so that you know, you'll get the money when I've got it. You know, I am working, I'm doing my best. I will do it when I can. So yeah, suicidal was 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 then. I've never felt like it again since because I've never been. In, I, I I will never be in a place as bad as that again. Have you taken anything new? No, I came off. I was six months of random, and I I come off them and I was fine, absolutely fine. I went back on them again when I got arrested because I felt fucking miserable. <laughs> <laughs> it's understandable. <laughs> so yeah, I felt like oh great. So I took. I went on them again. I, in fact, what had happened? I'd come out of. I'd been remanded in Gloucester in 2011 in, in August. Was that for the first conspiracy charge or the second? Oh, second one, so I'll tell, you that, tell you that one first. Yeah, so how does how does that happen, both two conspiracy oh. charges? Was it the same charge? Same charge, different different police force. So I was fucking annoyed. So basically, I'd, I'd, I'd been given bail for the, the interview finished on the first one, me talking like an idiot. And they came back in after the interview. So oh, stranger things have happened. You're, you're being released on bail for a fucking result. So I, I get to go home to my, my wife now and explain what the fuck's been going on because she knew nothing about it. And it was just business as normal. I went back to the garage the next day, opened up, opened the doors, you know, trading as usual. And then I had to go back and sign my bail the following month in May. They charged me with conspiracy, which I was half expecting it anyway. But that kind of made me knew that now I've got to run a trial with everyone else that's on this case. But then it's just kind of just getting on my life, you know, I was just doing a, doing a few, um, the garage was quiet, the recession was really quiet, we were ticking over, we weren't really making much money, it was still hard, still difficult, and it was slowly declining. Now what had happened then, is in June, my co-defendants or my suppliers, they got arrested, I've gone and seen him, in April after I've got nicked and I went to his garage he had a garage as well ironically doing motorsport I said mate we are fucked I said I've been arrested they're watching me they're probably going to be watching you You, he'd suffered a couple of a couple of arrests prior to that as well and it was mirroring what's happened in my organisation he was suffering hits same as I was only the trouble is it's where he owed money to Serbian so his was a very different situation than mine I owed money to him and he was good as gold he owed money to them and they, they were a bit more persistent in wanting their money back so he had to keep trading so in June, they all got nicked in his conspiracy. That was with Gloucestershire and Thames Valley. So it was like a combined effort to take them that lot. So they all got nicked in June. So then I thought, fucking hell, he's gone. So that's it now, it's dead. There's no point in bond. So I'd stopped. I'd actually stopped trading. There's no point really continuing with, with no customers. So I was out of it, you know. Um, and then July came, July the 25th. And then I sat in my garage again, just minding my own business. And... Some cars turn up outside of four and they're back again. Wonder what they're back for. Maybe they've forgotten something. I presumed it. I just thought it'd be even in Somerset. And it was in a whole brand new set of coppers. I thought, who the fuck are this lot? So Rich Jones and I sat and I said, Yeah. So you're under arrest for conspiracy to spike cocaine. I thought, again. I said, How does that work? I said, I've been done with it. I said, No, we're doing you again. So we're I said, we're not even in Somerset, we're Gloucestershire. We're arresting you on another charge associated with other people. And oh fucking hell. So they hit me again. What evidence do they have on you? Telephones, just connection with the phone. Just comms, yeah. They catch you with your phone. No, not the burners. No, no. So how did they know it was you? Because there was a um, an informant on the case. He was giving all the numbers. Now what had happened? The cell site over the investigation period of say six months, they were watching me. The burner phones. This is pre-encro chat. Were bounced off certain masts. And over a period of time, in your well, house, in your office. Well, I always, I always took it apart in the office or at the house it was never it was never there but there was a transit route or if I was in, in town on the meeting and I had both phones on me if on the rare occasion I get a phone call in the same location on both phones not at the same time but in the same location they both bounce for the same mast wouldn't they so over time they would pick up they'd build a pattern and they'd make an assumption that those phones are yours yeah so it's not just a case of look you put on that phone there that's a big case that they've yeah. surveilled on you for a long time to gather that evidence yeah. but for you to get a 15 now I haven't interviewed serious drug smugglers who yeah. smuggle 500k a week mm. get eight years 10 years so for somebody that's doing a few boxes here and there yeah to then get a 15 first offense how the fuck does that work i have no idea so basically i was looking at the um when i was found guilty so i got not guilty on one conspiracy charge no deal 
No, well, yes, this is the interview, right? So I went on the second interview with Gloucestershire. I'm a brief, the same guy. He said, what do you want to do? I said, so what do you suggest? You should have fucking sacked him, man. He said, yeah, I know. I was legal aid. I couldn't, I yeah. couldn't afford it. I had no money. I was obviously on my ass. He said, um, he said, don't say anything, mate. I said, well, like nothing. He said, don't say a fucking word. I said, I like that. That's what I need. Someone to tell me, don't, don't put ideas in my head. So I sat in the interview and I sat down as me, him, one copper there, one there. And the guy that was interviewing, he was arrogant and it was probably probably not his fault because I believe it was his first major case in soccer. He, he was heading up the investigation or he was given the responsibility to do certain things. And they got info from Avon and Somerset. Yeah, this guy's right. He'll, he'll talk. He'll drop himself right in the shit. And he looked at me and he said, right, confirm your name. Yeah, Rich Jones. And then he goes off and looked at me brief and he's got his questions out. And he starts asking questions. I just looked at him on it. And looked at his partner, right? And I was just like, and he's looked at his partner and looked at the brief. He goes, is, is it this, um, is it a no comment or is he just thinking? And the brief goes, I just looked at him and he, then he sort of asked him and then you can see he just went, he just deflated. And they asked me another question. I just, just stared at him again, I stared at his partner and looked at the camera up there because it, it was on the first one I'd done on a DVD. It was recorded like visually as well as audio. And I had this routine. I just look at him, look at his partner, look at the camera. That's all I did for three hours. Didn't say a fucking word. And you could see that he had these questions, like reams of paper full of questions. He had to read every single one out. And I just looked at him, just stared at him on the way through. And it was very satisfying. Very satisfying. Why do you think that is? I think it's because it kind of reminded me of interrogation training in the army. The first time I got to use it properly, apart from giving your name, rank and number, I just sat there and I thought I wasn't going to be bullied anymore. I wasn't going to be pushed. I, d I didn't like the idea that I was going to be beaten. And part of me just wanted to... Just, I, and, and you know what? I was just fucking annoyed that I'd been arrested again for the same thing. I was actually... First time I was like, yeah, I expected this. I knew it was coming, I, 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 and I, I almost welcomed it because I was ready for it. You know, I've, I'd had enough. I wanted to, I wanted to get off that ride. But when they come around again, I was just fucking put out. I thought, no, nah, you can't do this. This is wrong. So I went in more into sort of like a, like an, not an attack mode, but more of a like, I'm fucking digging in this time, mate. I'm digging in. I'm not, I'm not going to give you anything because I'm not fucking happy about this. And plus, the names on the indictment. I didn't know I was working with fucking Serbians at the time. I thought, I don't recognise those names. I'm not going to drop them in the shit. These are fucking serious people. Was your two charges put into the one trial or was it two separate yeah, trials? Yeah, so this was a complicated thing they had to deal with because I was the only one with two charges. So you had Operation Kestrel, which is Bristol, which was my, my conspiracy. Operation Berlin, which was the other one, which is Gloucestershire and Thames Valley. Now, I was the only one with two. So I was the only common factor between the two trials. And they had this massive loads of like court hearings prior to the trial so what are we going to do with Jones what are we going to do with him should we do severance should we do join us should we join should we have one big fuck off trial with 13 you know 13 people sat in the dock or should we have two and then if we have two should we do Jones on one should we, should we make him run two trials or should we make him run one trial with both counts on one trial and, and they were arguing about what would be most effective to get a prosecution but my defence was saying well no let's let's give him a fucking chance you know let's, let's. so what they did in the end they put me on they ran two trials, one one for Op Berlin and one for Op Kestrel. But they mixed it all up. They had different people on different trials. So what they did is said, well, let's take everyone. Let's put the guys at the top of the indictment on one trial. So let's get the Serb, my supplier, me and two other guys on that one. Not to confuse the jury. Not to confuse the jury, yeah. And yeah. One, one guy on there, he shouldn't even been on the fucking trial. And let's put everyone else on the other one, starting with a the, with the look. Because some guys are pleaded guilty. You know, which fucked nah. us anyway. Yeah. So were you thinking if they pleaded guilty that there's a chance that you could have got off or were you thinking I'm going to fight it? Well, Being they, naive with the, op the intelligence yeah. against you. Yeah, we didn't you know what You were fucked like. anyway. Yeah, we didn't know what they had. Were you offered a deal? No. No, no deal. No such fucking luck. I wouldn't have taken it. If, if they did offer a deal, so have you got any names? I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done it. I would have gone down. But they didn't. <laughs> they had the guy they wanted. Now, I was the leading role. That's, that's who they needed in that conspiracy. You? Yeah. Yeah. And that's when you got to 15? Yeah. What were you thinking then? That's a fucking life sentence. Well, I was looking at the, the, the guidelines and I was trying to work it out because the guidelines are, you've got three 
three uh, three roles and four categories cat one to four roles leading role significant and lesser I'm trying to work right. what's been fucking seized on these arrests so there was right, he had a court and one and a quarter kilos low purity it was fucking awful he got nicked with some four and a half ounces and that was a bit higher he got nicked with an ounce add it all together right that's it's fucking one and a half kilos at best not even that it's less than one and a half kilos I'm thinking right now do they take that into, do they think right is it purity based so do they account is it one kilo of pure cocaine and not consider the volume so I couldn't figure out what the guidelines were because they're, they're quite... Are they trying to figure out, is it that what you say, a day, a week? Yeah, so what they did in the end was was they calculated how much coke I would have taken from my suppliers and distributed. So they said, well, we know that he's gone down to down to M4 once a week. He's come back once a week and we know you're having at least a kilo. And we've got him logged for 22 journeys, so we're going to say you've had at least 22 kilos. So they based it on that figure. But how can they do that? It's just the thing of a conspiracy. They'll say, right, over a lot of period of time, we know you sold this much coke. So they must have had a lot of surveillance on you then? On the, on the routes, yeah. We think the car was probably on trackers. Yeah, So they knew they'd gone down. So yeah, so based on 22 keys. So I, my, I'm, in my head, I'm thinking, well, I'm, I'm category two, thinking less than a kilo, but it wasn't. I was trying to fucking hope. Worst case, low end category one, which is category one is between 12 and 16 years. I'm thinking, right, I'm looking at, I reckon, between 10 and 12. He might take some off because I was in the army. And your dad's a copper? My dad's a copper. He might fuck me even more for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think he did. Uh -huh. So he came to sentencing and and when he ran out, he, he doesn't just say, you're having fit, Mr. Jones will give you 15 years to take him down. He'll read out a bit of a paragraph and explain how he's come to this conclusion and any mitigation, any any aggravating factors. He'll weigh it all up and he'll say, oh, I've come to, and, and I have my wife and my, I think my dad and a few friends in the dock and they're sat there and I'm in me fucking someone else's jeans. I've been sent, I've been sent down. I've got, instead of being there in a prison track, so I borrowed clothes to wear and I'd fuck all I was on my man. I'm looking across at him and when he says 15 years, in my head, I'd, I'd had like 13 worst case. 11 was in my head for some reason. When he said 15, I thought, fucking hell, I looked across at my family and looked across at that. My wife just fucking, you see she went past. She passed that when I had, when I had the guilty verdict, you know, uh, five weeks prior to that. And I looked across and my dad's face like that. He just couldn't believe it because I protested innocence to him. So oh, I didn't do it, dad. So he's now thinking that his son's been given 15 years for nothing. And I just, all I'll do is oh, I'll call you later. And I just, that was it. I've been taken down the back. Did you, ever, did you ever have that conversation with your dad and end up Never to, got to. to Never got, got very into it. Yeah, when he had his stroke in 2016, the thing is with me, dad, I always wanted to sit down and say, I did it, dad. I'm sorry. Yeah, ashamed. Yeah, 100%. You know, ashamed of, of, of letting, not ashamed of how I feel, but ashamed of how he might feel, how it might reflect on him. Because that's important to me. And, and he's, he's a good man. You know, he doesn't, and but what I've realised is now he, he doesn't really give a fuck. He, he's, he's not actually that bothered by it all. What he's more fussed about was his son going to prison. He doesn't care why, you know. And I said to myself, on more times than I can think, I said, what's worse is is people thinking you're in prison as an innocent man, or them knowing you're guilty of that offence. Thought, what's worse? Which one's worse for my dad? Him knowing I've been turned into a drug dealer. Or him thinking I'm in jail and I shouldn't be in there. Which one would cut you up more if you if you if you think your son's innocent or if you fucking know which 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 is worse? I think think your son's in being innocent would be the I hard think one. so. I think so. Like if you just put your cards on the table and says, Look, I fucked up. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. He would have knew anyway. He's yeah. not daft, he would have probably got some intelligence and read your case or whatever yeah. anyway. Do you know I what think I mean? he's always known. Yeah. I think he's just played the game. I think he's always played the game of like ignorance because but that's but where you and your father come together just like yourself being yeah. ignorant and naive to certain things even though you know yeah. it's right for wrong mm. you still done wrong your dad would have known exactly the same but he was yeah. just playing the game as if I don't yeah. want to believe it but I know what's yeah. going on ignorance is bliss isn't it yeah. you know and, and I don't think he's, an, he's he's no angel you know when, when I came out of the army he would be him and his friend would say oh we, we need we need some retribution rich can you go and do this for us and it'd be little things like someone might have fucked them off and I'd have to go and fucking paint strip with their car with some fucking you know some, with some brake fluid or something. it was little things like that to teach people a lesson and that's my dad 
saying, oh, Rich, can you go do this? We'll chuck you 50 quid. And I'm thinking, well, he's not against a bit of fucking naughtiness, is he? He's asking me to do these things. So I'm thinking he's never batted straight. I'm not saying when he was in the police, because he had a fucking good job in the police. He, he was like, he was right up there. You know, I can't see what he was doing, but it, it involved, you know, he was doing bodyguard work as well. As I can't really say much more on that, but he was right up there. He wasn't just walking on the street. He was, he had a really good job. You so know. how, so getting a, a 15 stretch, with absolutely fuck all to come out with, no money, still in debt, relationship broken with the missus, kids not going to see their dad, lying, lying to your own dad, what the fuck is it all about then? Yeah. I think what when I was inside, I had the opportunity to try and start confessing to people. So that I did do it. I did do it. Now, the only chance I got to do it is one was me, with me, my wife. Um, she supported me all through, all through the sentence. She was there all through. Uh, we, we, are, we are, we're a very strong set of parents. We're, we're no good as a couple. Because we just we just we just just didn't work out, you know, because of depression and everything else, it just didn't work out. I was never in the room enough emotionally to be able to to, to give her the love that she needed, you know. And same from her, and she suffered with postnatal depression for both our kids. So she was in a bad way. So we'd gone through bouts of depression on both sides. So it was a very difficult thing, but we're a really strong unit for our kids. So she's never really, you know, she said like, "You're an idiot," but you know, why didn't you tell me? I thought I couldn't tell you because you're then privy to it. You, you're then party to it. If you know, you're you're as guilty as I am, you know. So we discussed it on the first couple of visits. So yeah, look, I don't stress. I I am guilty. I did do it, you know. But it's you know, it's just one of those things. You're like, all right, don't worry about. It. We just got the kids. That's the main thing. I told me mum. Told her the truth on my first release on temporary license. I've been in like fucking five years, but telling someone in a visit hall with those people around isn't the right place to no. to. to to, to declare your your guilt if you like too many tears around men that you're not supposed to cry in front of yeah you can't do that mate you know, I've seen it and I've, I've been there I've done it you know I'm sat there when I had my first visit with, with in Loudoun Grange when my wife brought in our kids my youngest was only six no he just turned seven you know and I came out into that visit hall and seen him and we had a we had a good visit it was nice it was the best we could have, you know. It was all that we could have at that time. That was it. That that was going to be our family now. That's how we're going to have our family life for the next seven years. And when we got up, my son said he didn't want to. He said, "Dad, I don't want to go." And he was crying. He was he wouldn't let go of me. And of course, the screws said, "Come on, we've got to get you back in." It wasn't like on the TV where they come and grab you and push you out of the way. They're very considerate. They said, "Come on, we ought to go." I said, "Let me." I said, "I got to go." He said, "Dad, I don't want you to go." And he's crying. I was crying. It was horrible. It was really bad. And that that was punishment right there. That was that was my, that was my yeah that was my seven years punishment straight away in that in that sort of like ten minutes of seeing the devastation of my son. My oldest was okay; he was a bit older. He he, he was he was coping better, but my youngest he, he was seeing his dad being taken away from him. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. Horrible, mate. Horrible. But then you've got to face the consequences when you're doing the bad shit. Yeah. Tell me, this this might seem like a mad weird question, but for you being regimented, did you handle prison better? Being yeah. inside, being in a kind of Order again, yeah. like army style. Yeah, definitely. I, I, what I found was initially the emotional side of it, I compartmentalised things, stuck all the feelings from my family, my kids, my love of cars, everything I liked, everything I wanted to, to be a part of, removed the emotion completely, boxed it off. Didn't fucking need it. That's no good to me. I can't use that right now. There's no point having those feelings for anyone because... I can't benefit from them. They're only going to cause me distress and pain. So I may as well just fucking bin those off and just get off my sentence. Once I'd done that, I thrived. I thrived in prison because I, had, I and a lot of people do, it's not just a squatty thing. If you can deal with your emotions inside and deal with the fact that you are inside, you've got no control over that, or you've got limited control over your life, you do really well in jail. You, you can, you can, you can monopolize on it to a point. You can, you can turn yourself around and you can, create the better version of yourself. And that's what I did. I did me courses. I I actually enjoyed being around some of the lads, which for me is that being a part of something, we had that common ground. Not big groups, but but like like me, I'll just sat alone, I'll sit down and have a chat with a few people and I'll, and I'll, I'll bail out under my terms, you know? And I found prison, apart from the detachment, relatively easy. You know, I enjoyed it. And being a veteran helped in, in lots of ways. Helped with the, the structure and... and and the fact that we're used to being in a, an environment with, with, with barbed wire fences because the only difference is the, the wires on the outside on the army camps and on the prisons on the inside. We're used to being surrounded in, in a sterile environment. 
not a problem. You know, prison's very much like that. It's a concrete jungle. And, and it's a very stag environment. Isn't it? There's a load of men around and, that, and you're used to that as well. So that hierarchy works. You know, you know where you fit in. I can't believe you get a 15. It's fucking harsh, isn't it? So what happens then for you when you get out? Your life like for the last five, six years? Yeah, so you're on, so on licence now. So with, um, with probation... So basically, you when did do, you get out? Two thousand July. Do you know what? It's fucking two years next week. So you only been out two years. Yeah, yeah. July the still 12th. fresh. Yeah, still fresh. How are you handling society and noise pressure again? First, luckily, I benefit from a thing called rotel. I don't know if you know what that is. No. Release, so it's release on temporary license. So your last two years when you're in jail, you get moved to the open estate like a cat D. I chose to stay in closed conditions because of my support of veterans inside. I chose to remain at a cat C, but I still got released on a daily basis to work in the community. So that kind of, the first day out was fucking weird. Apart from the time I went to see my dad when he had a stroke, that was my first time out of prison in, in nearly five years. When I walked out of those gates for the first time, it was like a fucking wild animal being released into the wild. You were a bit hesitant. Mm -hmm. So I stood, they said, oh, you're going to work in the, the visiting centre just across the road. So you're going to go out you turn right, you're going to see the building, that's where you're going. And you've got so many restrictions on your paperwork, on your license. You're like, don't do this, don't do that. Don't fucking go out your barriers. You can't drink, can't this. Don't speak to anyone. Don't disrespect the public. There's so many things. You've got all these rules running in like a software in your mind thinking, right, can't do this. And then, so the restrictions are massive. So you walk out of prison, you go out via the vehicle lock where the vehicles go in. Big old doors, isn't it? So... You go through a sterile area, which it is what it is. There's nothing in there. It's just a, an open area between the prison and the building, which has got the gates to, to, the, to the outside. So you walk across that to these big fucking doors where the vehicles will come in with the, with the sweat box, push a button, and they, 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 you wait for Everything's waiting. You wait for 10 minutes or so. You're a beep, and then you know, the mechanical door open. Think, fucking hell. I'm, like, I'm one door away from the outside world, and I've got cuffs on. I'm going to be walking outside. So you walk into the vehicle lock, the door shuts behind you. So you then this in this airlock, which is known as just for searching. There's lockers in there, and it's where the vehicles come in and they get they get um, checked for you know content, you know, smuggling, everything else. Go to a small office at the end. There's the gatehouse or the gatekeeper. You give them your license. You show them that you're allowed to get out. You check your ID. You you biometrics scan your fingerprints so they know it's you and not somebody else. Once they're happy with it, they, they push the button for the outside door. It's a really nice April day and it was it was red hot. And um, the door starts opening and I saw the outside world for the first time as a technically a free man on license. I stood there, I was fucking looking around this door and the guy goes, go on, mate, off you go. Like, oh, okay. like Almost like ushering this wild animal out of, out of the cage because I'm not quite sure what to do. I didn't know what to do and I walked out and, I, and the air hit me differently. It's very different when you're in prison. When the wind blows, it because there's so many high fences and buildings, it 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 lands differently. It kind of whips around, and, and it, you don't get gusts. When you go outside, you get a natural breeze, but you don't get that inside. And with that breeze comes smells, petrol, flowers, pollen, blossom from the trees. Because this is all on the trees at the time. So I walked out, and I could smell all these smells I hadn't smelt properly in years. And it's like a sensory overload. And it was mental. And, and just the fact that I had to cross a road. I'd not crossed a road in five years. You know, I had to look, you know, watch out for fucking cars because you don't get cars in prison. <laughs> you, know, they, you don't get traffic in prison. So we have a road in prison for things like ambulances and works vehicles, which they go at a crawling pace, the same speed as you walk. We don't get traffic. So you've got to look, look, at the, look for the cars over you go. You know, and then that was really weird. And what I found really not disturbing was someone that got me the most. Sat in this visiting centre waiting to, to, to work and I was working in a cafe I'm pretty good at catering so I'm alright with that I'm comfortable with that and everyone's on phones I mean I had smartphones when I went to work I, the iPhone 4 was out when I, when I was last in that's 2012 so I knew what phones were and I knew what smartphones were but I wasn't prepared for how many people had their heads buried in them completely absorbed into their phones and I sat there and when I heard the first, first phone ring I fucking had to sit up and look around because I'd not heard a mobile ring in years I didn't know what it, I knew what it was. I was just not used to hearing it. And then I'm thinking, shit, that's not, I'm not supposed to hear that because I'm not, if you hear a mobile phone ringing in prison, it's because someone's got it stuck up their ass. <laughs> you yeah. know, they're waiting to do this in the night safe, waiting for the, waiting for the, the screws to fuck off so they can make their phone calls. You don't hear mobile phones ring. It just doesn't happen. 
It's to hear a phone ring on there. So it's like, oh, this is weird. And then handling money, speaking to different people. And, and they're, they're people. They're not prisoners. So your conversation is different. And they don't know you're a prisoner because I don't look like a prisoner. Same as I didn't look like a drug dealer or I didn't like this. I look more like a fucking copper than I do a drug dealer, which is problematic. You know, so all these different things that you're experiencing for the first time in all these years. It was really weird. Weird, but that's an LTP. That's a long fucking sentence. That's not yeah. just a, a slap in the wrist where you're getting 12 months, 18 yeah. months. It's, it's years and years of your life. Yeah. Where do you go forward now for yeah. the future, Rich? What's your plans? So what I've got now is while I was inside, um, rewind the clock to 2016, or to, if go back even a little bit further, I was given the chance to be a veterans in custody rep. Yeah, because I knew that I'd, I'd kind of identified that the one thing that's going to keep me out of trouble was if I focus on something and try and help people out. So I got a job as a vet, a VIC rep, veterans in custody. I did that job with, with, with drive and passion. I loved it. You know, I was meeting guys and on a daily basis going around supporting veterans, getting what they need. You know, if they've got PTSD, let's get them referred to healthcare and all these sort of things I was really keen to do. And um, over sort of like about a year, I'd looked at these guys and I'd chat to them. I thought, like, we've all suffered similar problems. The offences were different. They ranged, they ranged right across the board, all different offences. But I'd noticed that we'd all suffer with our transition in one way or another. You know, we'd had a shitty time. We'd come out, certain things weren't in place, certain things weren't right. And I thought, there's got to be something we can do about this. So I spoke to the intervention team, which deal with things called programmes. So when you go down, you're given a sentence plan. And that sentence plan will... will indicate whether you need support, whether you've got to do a course, you know, whether you just got to behave yourself. And generally speaking, it means do a course of some kind. If, if you're in for violence, do one on anger management. If you're in for drugs, do one on substance misuse. That ticks a box. Probation says, yeah, he's addressed his offender behaviour. He's going to be all right now. Let's, let's let him out. It doesn't. It's just a tick box exercise. So I said to the people in charge, I said, look, do we have any interventions out there which are specifically written and engineered towards veterans who struggle in the community. So I did a bit of research. They said, no, we ain't got nothing. I said, well, can I, can I write one then? Because I said, I've got a lot of knowledge now. So can I can I create one? I said, yeah, you can do that. That's not an issue. You can have a look at that. So I did a real course. I wrote a course called Project TLS. And I kept the TLS. People say, what's TLS mean? So I just, you know, I, did, I kept it. Because I already had the idea about the lost soldier. So I didn't tell them what the TLS meant. It means the lost serviceman or service person. I'm going to be politically correct. So I created this course based on 12 modules. And basically what it was, it was about a way of, of getting the veterans in, sitting a course with me. And I started delivering that in, in Oakwood, my CAT C in 2016. I was delivering that course up until the day, up until the year of my release with great success to the point where the director of the prison said, look, we want you to come back when, you've, when you're released and we'll look at trying to secure funding for you to deliver that course in the prison to continue supporting prisoners or at least veterans. Then we'll try and get into other prisons and do that as your day job. So that was the plan was that course of the around the course I, I built a, a food bank working with Greg's so we get all the uneaten pasties and donuts and we fatten up the squad as without well. do a food bank we were until COVID I do a furniture bank with a company called we like to move it and my, my day job at the minute is removals so we get donated furniture on a, on a weekly basis which we then refer to say through SAFA who's a massive organisation and we will then see look hey, we've got a veteran moving into a house he's got no furniture have you got any fridges any units yeah we'll donate that we'll get it dropped down to him free of charge so we're looking after the squaddies and the, 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 the tricep as much as we can with that but that's during COVID but COVID has really sort of like delayed everything by at least a year I'm just waiting for it to pick up again for anybody watching that's maybe battling with suicidal thoughts, mm. what advice would you give for them? Just get some help straight away. You know, it's, it's hard. The hardest thing is asking for help because identifying that your mental health has taken a decline, it creeps up on you. Depression creeps up on you. And it's got a habit of biting you in the ass and getting to the point where it gets so severe that you can become cat catatonic and you don't want to do anything. You just sat like that. You, know, you, you don't even want to move anymore. And that's when you've gone too far. Samaritans are good speak to someone you know but for me it worked taking out with a doctor antidepressants worked for me they don't work with everyone um look at your triggers look at what's got you depressed you know you it, things can be dealt with i've dealt with my anxieties and my demons with something called emdr treatment i had treatment last year it deals with ptsd 
No, I found out. I didn't realise I had PTSD. Is that where some of the twitches come from? Yeah. Yeah, really bad. I've got a lot of stress and anxiety built up inside of me as well. And Is what, that we bottling everything up over the years? I think so, yeah. Yeah. That's why it's important to talk, yeah? Mm, because 100%, mate, yeah. You get into prison and saying, right, I'm just going to block out those emotions. Yeah. Once you come out, they're going to fucking arise again. Yeah. So it's difficult, bad. but it's easier said than done because yeah. I bottled all my shit up for years. It's only the last few yeah. years I've been learnt. Like, these chats, these mm. are like therapy for me as well. Yeah. Because I can understand on a deeper level. Yeah. But that's yeah. what it's all about for people watching. They can understand that yeah. deeper level that it's just, everything's kind of just all fucking fucked up. It's healing, isn't it? Because yeah. I, I find talking about the problems with someone that knows what they're talking about or, or someone that's lived that same journey you realise that you weren't on your own and you realise that, fuck, I could have dealt with that so much sooner. And EMDR for me was a, was a miracle cure for anxiety. There's still stresses inside me. I know that because I feel it physically. I feel the physical manifestation of stress and anxiety. But I don't feel the emotional side of it because EMDR eradicated that emotion. It, it helped me to box off my PTSD from my organised crime days, which was, it was quite severe, although I didn't know it was severe. I have many triggers for anxiety and it kind of dealt with that really well and it does work a treat and it, it deals with underlying issues. If someone's dealing with, if someone is depressed, it can be linked from anything from historically as a childhood. If someone knows what their triggers are, someone knows why they got anxiety, they can be fixed with this treatment, you know, and it's amazing. It's mind blowing and it changed my life massively. Are you seeing the world differently now? Totally. I don't, I don't, my hypervigilance was my biggest problem. Always seeing a threat, always seeing a problem, always kind of visualizing that. I'll give you an example. If, um, if someone, not so much now, if someone had left a negative comment on social media, I would see that as a threat. It's not, it's a negative comment. I'd have gone straight to DEFCON 5 and start fucking planning things in my head, right, I need to protect my missus, I've got to protect the kids, I've got to fucking, right, let's, let's check outside the house, let's find out where they live. And I'm already planning things because I'm assuming the worst case scenario because in in drug dealing, it usually is worst case scenario. It, the, the threats are very real. If someone says, I'm coming around your house, they're coming around your house and not coming alone and not coming without, without some sort of hardware. So the, a threat I took, literally, and it could be someone leaving a random, flippant comment on social media. I would see that as a direct threat to life and I'll treat it accordingly. And that's crazy. It really is. That's crazy person to talk. And that's, that was me. That's how I was in my head. But the EMDR took that away. It made me realize that triggers through experience in my life of, of for association of certain threats and made me think that I've had to deal with things in a certain way because that threat is real. But it's something to realize that it's not. Knocks at the door for me were really bad. Yeah. Couldn't, if I got a knock from the door and I wasn't expecting it, that's a problem for me. Don't care now, it doesn't matter. But it's good you're identifying with these things. That's where you yeah. can make the change and that's important. Mm. Would you like to finish up on anything, brother? I just want to thank you very much, mate. I ju I've just enjoyed the chance to talk about it. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yeah. Rich, for coming on today, brother, and telling no your worries, story. Mate. I thoroughly enjoyed that. No worries, mate. And um, people, we'll leave the link in the description. All your links, send me them over. We'll put them in the description for people to maybe help you out with yeah. food banks and no worries, mate. furniture, stuff like that. But yeah. God bless you, brother. Stay you too, out of trouble. And I look forward to seeing the rest of your journey. Yes, also, mate. we'll finish up TikTok. You're very big on TikTok. You've got yeah, a big following yeah, on TikTok. So How can people get and follow you? Under, as the Lost Soldier, which gets banned regularly so i've got the lost mm. soldier one uh lost soldier backup <laughs> i've got mm. a few accounts so yeah. the lost soldier's the main one there's literally thousands of videos anything on there covers everything Perfect. there's so much on there there's there's that's why i get banned so much listen brother god bless you and nice stay strong take, take care. care thank you Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.